I don't know the proper like TV broadcast lingo, but like 10 seconds, Randy, and then you should be good. Okay. Yeah, I've got that. We're live. I'll give it an extra little buffer. Okay, you're All good. Right. All right, good. Thanks, Dylan. Welcome, everybody. So we're um, kicking off our virtual Northern Continental Divide Ecosystem Subcommittee meeting. Um, it's May 29th, 2020, and we're handling this virtually, uh, which very much appreciate uh, Yellowstone Ecosystem taking the lead in doing this, and, um, and Lori Roberts for prompting me to, to uh, I think she shamed me into hosting this, and maybe she doesn't see it that way, but uh, very much appreciate the nudge because um, as if for those of you involved, when we made the decision to cancel this meeting, we were supposed to be doing this meeting with as uh, co-hosting with the Selkirk Cabinet Yak, and we were going to do a joint meeting of the two subcommittees. And when the, the COVID stuff was rolling pretty heavily and we were starting to do shutdowns, we forecasted the need to cancel that meeting. And at the time, I remember thinking that there was no way that we would host this meeting because we couldn't get everybody to a Forest Service office to stream it on the Forest Service, and therefore there's just no way to do this. Of course, we've all become quite adept at managing these things virtually. Um, so very much appreciate the extra effort on everybody's part to join us here today. Um, I do want to uh, give just a couple minutes to Dylan, a minute or two, um, if he wants to walk through any procedural stuff as far as participating and using the system and, and any notes to any public who have called in. Um, so Dylan, if you give that just a minute and then I can do introductions. Yeah, thanks, Randy. Uh, my name is Dylan Tabish with Fish, Wildlife and Parks. Um, and I'm the information education um, chair for the NCD subcommittee. Uh, I'll start my video here, sorry. Uh, so yeah, I'm just helping Randy with some of the technological aspects here and we've got the panelists uh, all involved. So you will all be able to uh, unmute yourself, share your screen, uh, anything you need to do during the meeting. Um, and then any members of the public uh, who would like to provide input Later this afternoon, uh, you can look on the agenda approximately around 2.45, maybe a little earlier, 2.30. They'll have an opportunity to chime in and provide input on what we uh, talked about today. And um, so uh, there's instructions on the IGBC website. So if any members of the public out there go to igbconline.org and go to the meeting section, you'll find information on the NCD subcommittee meeting. And there's a telephone number there to call in uh, and you just follow the instructions, add the webinar ID and password, and then you'll be admitted to the meeting as an attendee. And um, then we'll ask you to press star nine when you're ready to provide input and we'll unmute you and everybody here will be able to hear you. Um, and then we just remind you, kind of like calling into the, your favorite radio show back in the day, you just have to mute your computer when you're ready to talk. That way um, we don't have that echoey echo chamber uh, scenario. So that's for members of the public. Uh, to participate later today and we'll give kind of a reminder on that after lunch but uh, this is being streamed live on YouTube right now on our Fish, Wildlife and Parks YouTube website uh, and that link is on our Facebook page as well as our uh, the IGBC website and this meeting is also being recorded so for folks who can't stay for the entire meeting but want to see the presentations uh, this meeting will entirely be saved and we'll post it on the IGBC website. Great, any questions for Dylan before we move to introductions? All right, great, thanks Dylan. So my name is Randy Arnold and I uh, am the Regional Supervisor for Fish, Wildlife and Parks for Region 2 out of Missoula. And I'm currently the Chair of the Northern Continental Divide Ecosystem Subcommittee. And when it comes to introductions on these things, I know different facilitators have handled this differently, but um, for me, I think what's been helpful is when you get um, not knowing what order and is the hardest part. So I think what I'll do is go through the order um, that, that I have on my screen uh, and we'll try to, as best I can, um, work through introductions really quickly uh, that way. So when I do, um, if you've got your camera available and or um, and if not then just unmute yourself but give us a quick look at yourself and say good morning and we'll roll on to the next person so with that the next person on my list is Jamie Jonkel yeah, I'm sorry I don't have a, a camera um, yeah, Jamie Jonkel Montana Fish Wildlife and Parks Region 2 uh, Bear Management 
Great, thanks, Jamie. Good morning, uh, Bill Avey. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Bill Avey, Forest Supervisor of the Helena Lewis and Clark National Forest. Great, uh, Brian Dunner. Hey, good morning, everybody. Brian Donner, District Ranger on the Fort Tyne and Rexford Ranger Districts in Eureka, representing the Kootenai National Forest. Thanks, good morning, Brian. Uh, Cecily. Hello, this is Cecily Costello. I'm a research wildlife biologist with Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks and I'm an advisor to the committee. Uh, Corey, you wanna introduce yourself? So Corey Lucker might not have been ready for that. He's our wildlife manager out of region four. I'm gonna pass you Corey, uh, Gary. Yeah, Gary Bertolotti, Regional Supervisor out of Great Falls uh, along the Rocky Mountain front, uh, eastern side of the NCD. Thanks, Gary. Uh, George Edwards. George Edwards, Montana Livestock Loss Board out of Helena. Uh, great. Thanks, George. Uh, Heather Stokes. Morning, everyone. I'm Heather Stokes with the Center for Natural Resources and Environmental Policy here representing the Grizzly Bear Advisory Council as a facilitator. Great. Thanks, Heather, for joining us today. Uh, Hillary. Hi, I'm Hillary Cooley. I work for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I'm the Grizzly Bear Recovery Coordinator. I'm an advisor to the group as well. Thanks, Hillary. Uh, Jennifer. Hi, my name is Jennifer Fortunoris. I work with Hillary in the Fish and Wildlife Service Grizzly Bear Recovery Office. All right, uh, Jim Williams. Good morning, everyone. Jim Williams, Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks Regional Supervisor out of Kalispell. Thanks, Jim. Uh, Jody. Good morning, everybody. Jody Bush, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, Supervisor for Ecological Services. I'm a member of this group. Thanks, Jody. Uh, Joe Wiegand. Good morning, Joe Wiegand. Montana Department of Transportation. I'm the Missoula District Biologist and cover uh, areas west of the Continental Divide. Thanks, Joe. Uh, John Waller. Good morning. Uh, John Waller, Wildlife Biologist at Glacier National Park and uh, sitting in for the moment for Jeff Mao. Thanks, John. Is Jeff going to join us later? Do you know? Uh, my understanding is that he has a, had a meeting conflict, but I think his intention is to join us in probably an hour or so. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, Ken McDonald. Good morning. This is Ken McDonald, um, Chief of the Wildlife Division with Fish, Life, and Parks in Helena. Thanks, Ken. Uh, Kurt Steele. Hey, good morning. Kurt Steele, uh, Flathead Forest Supervisor, new to the group, but looking forward to the conversation. And unfortunately, I'll have to step out uh, around one o'clock, I think, uh, for another meeting, but I'll come back afterwards. Great. Thanks, Kurt. Yeah, I, was, I had a note that you weren't going to be able to join us. Um, glad you were able to, and uh, welcome to the subcommittee. I'm 
um, and know that uh, offline you can certainly reach out to us, um, any of us, if you have questions. Um, but uh, thanks again for joining us. Uh, Rory Trimbo. Morning, everybody. Rory Trimbo with uh, FWP, the Grizzly Bear Management, um, based out of Deer Lodge Anaconda for the uh, focusing on the connectivity zone. Thanks, Rory. Glad you could join us this morning. Uh, Scott Jackson. Hey, morning, Randy. Hi, everybody. Scott Jackson here, uh, Forest Service, National Carnivore Program Lead based in Missoula in the regional office, and I'm an IGBC advisor. Great. Thanks, Scott. Um, Stacy Corville. Morning, uh, Stacy Corville, Confederate Salish and Kootenai Tribes Carnivore Management Specialist. Thanks, Stacy. So, um, I see his names joggle around on my list here. Uh, Tabitha Graves. Hi, everybody. It's good to see you all. Um, I'm Tabitha Graves. With I'm a research uh, biologist, ecologist with uh, the USGS and also here in an advisory role, um, sitting in for Claudia Reagan. Great, thanks. And uh, I, see, I see Tim. Um, I think I know which Tim, but we'll let him confirm that. Hi, uh, Tim Manley, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks out of Kalispell, Montana, Grizzly Bear Management. Great. Good morning, Tim. Thanks. Good morning. Uh, yep. And uh, Wesley Sarmento. Good morning, everyone. Wesley Sarmento, Montana, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, Bear Management, Region 4 out of Conrad. All right, Dylan, so a quick check for you if we're following here. Um, and I guess a quick check for everybody. Um, did anybody pop in here um, while we were doing introductions that I need to go back to? If so, uh, feel free to jump in and introduce yourself. Hopefully there aren't very many, if any. There is one person in the attendees and I don't. they don't have a name associated with them. So I guess if that's somebody who needs to get uh, promoted to the panel. Um, if you're listening, uh, contact me via email, dylan.tabish at mt.gov, and I will promote you. Or if you can rename yourself there in the attendees room, that way we'll know who you are. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Dylan. So a quick look at our agenda um, before we turn it over to our first agenda item. Um, we are planning on um, having Cecily present on the trend monitoring update. Um, Dylan's going to give an information education outreach uh, update. Heather Stokes from the Grizzly Bear Advisory Council, the facilitator there, is going to give us an update on how the Grizzly Bear Advisory Council has been going. And then we'll hear from Hillary Cooley um, update on the mortality subcommittee. We'll break for lunch, um, noon to one. And during that time, Dylan will keep this going, but he'll have uh, he'll be sharing his screen so that somebody that logs in or is watching the YouTube will be able to know or be able to see that, that we're still live and going, but it'll just identify that we're on a break. And then starting at uh, one o'clock, we'll reconvene and work through um, an update from Kathy Ake on habitat monitoring. And then just because we've had such um, a busy and active spring with grizzly bears so far, and because this meeting is a little later than normal, I um, thought we'd take advantage of the opportunity to hear from our specialists. Normally we do that in the fall when the specialists have an opportunity to present um, a little more cohesive understanding of what happened throughout the entire season. But we just thought it'd be worthwhile with just the activity we've had um, to take advantage of them as they're available. So not all of our specialists are available. And so that update um, may be amended as we go, depending on who's available, but just really looking forward to hearing from them, kind of a snapshot. And as it was relayed to me, it's a nice opportunity for us to be thinking about things we can do in this summer. If we see some trends already this spring on some things that we want to address, it's kind of a nice chance to um, compare notes 
And then we'll move to our roundtable discussion. And I apologize, I did, um, I might have missed a few folks in that roundtable. Um, if you don't have an update, that's okay. Um, we'll just roll through that pretty quickly. Uh, but otherwise, want to make sure that we at least left some time to roll through all the different agencies to see if there's some things we want to hit on. And then um, we'll provide some uh, time at the end for the public to provide uh, comment. We've left about 15 minutes there, but depending on how the agenda goes today and our timing, we might have a little more time there. And then we'll adjourn. So before I um, roll it to our first agenda item. I want to pause just long enough to see if anybody has any updates or changes or questions or concerns. All right, thanks. Uh, with that, I think I'll turn it over to Cecily if um, she wants to share her screen and we'll, we'll go from there. Okay, I'm going to um, get my um, screen started here. So what am I doing? <laughs> now I forgot how to do it. Okay. Share screen. Should be good. Yeah, right there on the bottom. Oops. I go back up. Okay, can everyone see that? Not yet. Oh. We got your background uh, with the, uh, I think you got the wrong screen shared. <laughs> How about that? There we go. Got there it? Go. Good. Okay. Um, so I'm going to give an update on the 2019 field season for the study in grizzly bear demographics in the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem. Um, I would like to acknowledge uh, our partners that work on this project, um, including Fish, Wildlife and Parks, the Blackfeet Nation, the CSKT National Park Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, and the US Forest Service. Um, I want to let people know that our annual report is available online. So some of this information that I'm giving you is detailed with a little bit more information on that report. And I thought I'd give you a clue as to how to find it on the website. If you go and look at the Fish and Wildlife tab, there's an area where you can get to wildlife research. Then you want to click on the icon for grizzly bears. Under grizzly bear research, you will see the tab for grizzly bear population monitoring, and that will take you to the Northern Continental Divide page. And then down here, you have reports. And if you click on that, you'll be able to access our report for this year. Just to orient everybody, this is the area that we're working in, in the Northern Continental Divide. These are the zones as they were um, identified in our conservation strategy. The PCA in blue is the equivalent to the recovery zone and the area around that is called zone one. And within that red line is the area where we concentrate our, um, habit, our, our population monitoring, where we do our trapping for research and trend monitoring. And then those other two zones um, relate to connectivity um, and an area out on the east front beyond where we um, do, do um, trend management or trend monitoring. So first I'm gonna just talk about our field results for the 2019 season, um, describing our captures, our vital rate monitoring and the monitoring of mortalities. Um, in 2019, we captured a total of 70 bears during 77 different capture occasions. In other words, we had seven recaptures of those 70 individuals. Um, we had 28 bears that were captured for trend monitoring and 12 of those were collared, primarily females. Our trend monitoring program is um, specializes in looking at females because they're the reproductive segment of the population and we try to get 
reproductive data as well as survival data from those females. Um, all around, we had 40 bears that were captured for management purposes and 19 of those were collared. So when we're looking at independent bear survival within the DMA, um, we monitored 73 bears with telemetry, 50 females and 23 males. Um, we observed the deaths of eight radio marked um, bears during 2019. Three of these were females and five were males. Um, none of those were in the research sample. So we had zero mortalities for research this year, this past year. Um, and all of the deaths were bears that were captured previously for management. Um, when we collar the bears, we try to um, monitor their reproductive status over time. Um, we try to do um, observation flights as early in the spring as possible when they're first coming out of the den and it, this makes it the most easy to observe them with new offspring or offspring from last year. Um, and then, but we also monitor, or we also document reproductive status of bears as they're captured over the year as well. So in 2019, we recorded reproductive status for 28 adult females. These are um, both from the research and the management sample. We had nine with cubs, eight with yearlings, three with two-year-old offspring and seven with no offspring. Um, the first observation for these ranged from the 14th of March, so getting an observation of a bear just coming out of the den, and the latest was October 7th when we captured a new female. Um, the average date for the observation of reproductive status was June 4th. Um, I thought it might be helpful just to show the second graph which is the same raw counts, but looking at them over time, you can see that there's quite a lot of variability in how many bears have cubs versus yearlings versus two-year-olds versus none within any given year. And that's partially related to sampling um, variation, but you can see that there's no obvious trend um, since 2004. Um, at the same time, we also try to look at cub litter size um, so that we can use that in our population modeling. Again, we try to get these observations as early in the spring as we can, but we also get information from bears that are captured later in the year. Um, for 2019, we had five females with one cub, three females with two cubs, and one female with three cubs. Uh, these observations ranged from April 16th to the 7th of October, and the average was June 19th. Again, we see no trend over time, um, but quite a lot of variability from year to year since 2004. Um, for dependent young sur mon survival monitoring, we follow um, litters of females that are radio marked. And we just assume that when they disappear from the side of their mother that they have died. Um, and in 2019, we were able to monitor the survival of nine cub litters with multiple observations over the course of the year. That included 14 cubs. Within those 14 cubs, we observed four presumed or known cub mortalities. We were able to monitor survival of eight yearlings within 50, or eight litters with 15 total yearlings. Um, and within that sample, we observed two known yearling mortalities. Um, these numbers are actually a little bit different than what is in the annual report because I wrote the annual report before we got some of our new observations for this spring. So we were able to document a few more litters um, after bears emerged from dens this spring. So we also document all known and probable mortalities throughout the ecosystem. This table here describes um, all, of the, all of the mortalities, including all age classes and all locations. Um, we documented 51 mortalities overall, 46 were inside the DMA and five were outside the DMA. 
um, two of the bears that were outside of the DNA were DMA, excuse me, were actually died in Canada, but they're included in this count because they were captured within Montana and they were wearing a collar that was put on from Montana. This is a visual of where those mortalities occurred. And you can see that um, in general, most of the mortalities occur on the periphery or outside of the recovery zone or the primary conservation area. Um, again, if you look at that um, as a trend, this is looking at mortalities that occurred within the PCA or recovery zone and areas outside of it um, between 2004 and 2019. And you can see that within the PCA, there's only a very slight increase in the numbers of mortalities that have occurred, but there is a dramatic increase outside of the recovery zone or the PCA. If we look at the causes for the known and probable mortalities um, within the entire ecosystem. Um, this is a comparison between uh, 2004 and 2018, the sum of all those and how 2019 might differ. Um, bear in mind that 35% of these mortalities were dependent young. And so we attributed the cause of death to the same as what happened to their mother. Um, agency removal, was the highest source of mortality. Um, two of these were bears that were removed and augmented to the cabinet yak population. Um, you can see that DOL and several illegal types of mortalities were lower in 2019 than um, generally was seen in the previous years. Um, but you can also see that it was a relatively high train mortality year. So the next thing I wanna talk about is taking this information and applying it to the conservation strategy objectives. Um, we have objectives for occupancy of females with offspring within the bear management units in um, the recovery zone and occupancy units within zone one. We also have a, a threshold for independent female survival that is estimated on a six year average. And then we have um, thresholds for independent female and male mortality that are also estimated on a six year window. And finally, I wanna talk a little bit about our connectivity monitoring to see how things are um, happening. So this is a quick table of the occupancy of reproductive females within the primary conservation area. Inside that area, we have 23 bear management units and we document whether or not a female with cubs, yearlings, or two-year-olds has been observed within that unit during the year. The X's mark years when these were observed. In 2019, we um, documented reproductive females within, within 18 of the units during 2019. But if we look at it over the last six years, 22 of the 23 units have been occupied, which exceeds the necessary threshold. Um, we have been missing observations um, from the Continental Divide unit, which is well within the Bob Marshall Wilderness. And we've don't believe that there are bears missing from that area. It's just a matter of not really having access um, to getting observations in there. And I will show you that in a map um, shortly. We also look at occupancy of females in zone one. We have, there are six occupancy units in zone one. Um, and we have a threshold of having at least six of those occupied over a six year time period. We documented bears in all seven in 2019. And of course that equates to the six year tally, all of them being occupied. So this is a map of those bear management units inside the recovery zone and the um, occupancy units in zone one. 
Um, if you look at the dark blue continental divide unit, that's that unit that we have not had any observations. Um, we're going to try to put a few cameras out in the wilderness to see if maybe we can beef up observations in that area. Um, but we just haven't really had an opportunity or had any collared bears that kind of moved into that area. Um, the lighter blue units have been occupied in the last six years, but were not verified um, specifically in 2019. So the next conservation strategy objective is to maintain a threshold of 93% um, for annual survival of independent aged females. This is what we, and this is based on a six year average. These are the values that we've observed during the last, since 2013. And in um, 2019, our six year average of female survival was 0.94, so above the threshold. Um, and then the next conservation strategy objectives are for um, total reported and unreported mortalities of independent female and male bears within the DMA. And um, this table, in, indicates how we estimate that. What we do is we take our um, documented mortalities, our reported mortalities, and then we um, inflate those a bit to estimate how many of those were not reported. So as you can see, the numbers within the box um, represent the documented mortalities, which, were, which included 11 females, 15 males, and three unknown sex. For the three unknown sex, we randomly assigned them to a sex, which ended up being one female and two males. And altogether, that's 29 documented mortalities of independent bears within the DMA. With our, with our inflation factor, that goes up to a total of 42, or um, 16 females and 26 males. We take those um, estimated mortality numbers, total mortality numbers, and we look at them on a six-year average as well, and then we compare those to our threshold. In the, for the females, the threshold um, has been 22, and this year it kind of went up to 23. Uh, the male threshold is 28, and it went up to 29, but you can see that our six-year average is below these thresholds. So again, we met the conservation strategy objectives for independent mortality numbers. And then finally, we, um, in the conservation strategy, we um, committed to looking for connectivity. We do a analysis of distribution um, biennially. So we last did that last year in 2018, and so we will repeat it again in 2020. So we're, we don't have anything new to present specifically on bear distribution. Um, and through DNA analysis, we try to detect whether or not there have been bears that have immigrated into the population from one of the other ecosystems. Um, and we have samples that have been analyzed through 2018 and we, again, still have not detected any immigration into the ND NCDE from other ecosystems. But I thought I might share this map, which shows uh, the distributions of the populations, the Cabinet Yak, the NCDE, and the Yellowstone population um, as of 2018. And the little darker marks are other verified observations that have occurred. The lighter marks are possible observations that weren't verified, but potentially could be a grizzly bear. And as you can see, um, we are starting to see quite a number of bears moving in the areas between the Northern Continental Divide and Yellowstone. So we are hopeful that there will be some movements between these ecosystems and the potential for it is certainly increasing over time. And then finally, I want to just discuss a little bit some of the other research that we've been working on and 
um, give you a little heads up on some things that we're hoping we'll be able to present to the subcommittee very soon. Um, we have been working with Paul Lukacs and Josh Nowak from the University of Montana to develop an integrated population model. We're also working with the study team in Yellowstone um, so that we can have a model that's somewhat similar. And we're hoping once we have this integrated model that a lot of these vital rates that we're reporting on, we can have more timely um, estimates, maybe even annual estimates that we can share. So um, I'm really looking forward to having that done. I'm hoping that by the fall or at the very least by next spring, we should have some information from that model that we can share. Um, I also wanted to mention that we have been working with Libby and Alex Metcalf from the University of Montana on a human attitude survey. This is a statewide study. It's not just related to the Northern Continental Divide, um, but we sent surveys to over 5,000 households and we received over 1,700 responses. Um, and we are in the process of analyzing those responses and the results should be available within the next few months. Um, and I'm really excited to see what we can get out of that. Um, Lori Roberts has been kind of our lead investigator on a multi-population investigation into Denning chronology and timing of parturition. We, are, we worked with the Yellowstone team, the Cabinet Yak team, and a team from up in Alaska. And so uh, I expect that we'll have some results to share on that either in the fall or next spring. And then I wanted to let people know that we have secured some funding to hire a postdoc named Sarah Sells to help us with modeling the range expansion. Um, her primary focus will be likely be on modeling specifically the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem, but we are collaborating with the other ecosystems to provide a comprehensive look of range expansion over time um, from all of the ecosystems. And with that, I would like to acknowledge the very many people that help with the data collection in the Northern Continental Divide. Um, this list includes the people that helped in the field, but we also get a lot of administrative, financial, and technical support from our par partner agencies, and there's many people to thank. So that's what I have. I can answer any questions if people have them. So again, if you do have questions, um, feel free to jump on in. We won't have a, an easy way to identify folks. So please ask them if you have them. Quick question, Cecily. I, you mentioned um, some additional distribution stuff with Sarah Sells. And I know she's done a lot with um, wolves and maybe even um, other big game um, species using patch occupancy. Is that something similar or will, she, it, will this be a new approach? Well, I think it's probably going to be a little more akin to what we did with our previous connectivity study, where we looked at male, uh, the potential paths for male movement between the Northern Continental Divide and Yellowstone and back and forth. Um, it's going to be building on that model. Um, so it's a movement model primarily, um, but we want to include information about females and we're going to try to include information about how animals use a home range so that we can determine areas where bears could settle as opposed to areas where bears might just move through. Great, so just thanks. A, yeah, look forward to that. Yeah, sorry, Kurt, go ahead. No worries, hey, so just a question when you're showing the map, it just seemed a little misleading on the Continental Divide. Um, obviously, if we haven't surveyed that, to show it as unoccupied seems like it should almost have another label, if you will, as not surveyed or something like that. It just seemed to well, me it it's being misleading. Um, we don't really call it unoccupied. It's just not documented as occupied. So, um, yeah.
Okay, uh, one last round. Anybody else with questions for Cecily? All right, let's, uh, thanks a lot, Cecily. That was really great. I'm really glad you were able to present that. Um, let's roll to Dylan, information education update. All right, thanks, Randy. Um, let's see, juggling a few things here. Let's see if I can do this. Sorry, Dylan, I'm gonna cut you off. I, there was two other, um, one other thing I wanted to catch. Uh, we had a couple of people join us and so sorry to put them on the spot, but I wanted to recognize it, those folks who joined us and see if they could introduce themselves really quickly. So um, I'll start with Amy Jacobs. Maybe if you could unmute yourself and un and maybe if you have video capability, just say hi really quick, Amy. Maybe while you're fumbling for your mute button, we'll see if Lori Roberts is able to say, give us a wave. I'm here, um, Lori Roberts, Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks. I work for the NCD trend monitoring team. You're not driving, are you Lori? I am not driving, I'm in the passenger seat. All right, thanks. <laughs> thanks for joining us, Lori. Uh, Amy? Yep. And Amy, your, for us, your screen went live, but I'm not able to hear you. Oh, there you are. I can see you, but I still can't hear you. Well, we'll, we'll uh, do semaphore if we need some comments from you. Uh, great, thanks Dylan, on to you. All right, thank you, Randy. Um, well, and there you just uh, introduced, I guess, two of our uh, uh, other folks who are involved with uh, information and education outreach. Um, so Lori Roberts is uh, taking over as chair for the IGBC for information, education, and outreach. Uh, and she's uh, taken the baton from Kim Annis, who was the previous chair. And, and those two ladies deserve a ton of credit for really uh, revitalizing that uh, effort, I think. The information, education, outreach is obviously a huge, um, far-reaching uh, effort. And so those two, Lori and Kim, have really done a great job of... Uh, yeah, just getting that going and really uh, thinking outside the box a little bit on some of the stuff we're doing. So I'll give a little bit of an update on that and then also um, talk a little bit about uh, the Information Education Outreach Summit that Fish, Wildlife and Parks spearheaded this past winter. Um, so I guess uh, before I share my screen, um, I'll kind of reintroduce myself and the role I'm playing now. Uh, I'm uh, information education program manager with Fish, Wildlife and Parks in Region 1 um, and have been working as the INE chair for the NCDE subcommittee. Um, although I'll be the first to admit I have done probably the least amount of work as uh, compared to particularly uh, my fellow subcommittee uh, folks who are Lynn Johnson uh, from the Kootenai National Forest, Whisper Means from Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes, Amy Jacobs from Flatten National Forest, and Kathy Bushnell from Helena, Lewis, and Clark National Forest. And those are the folks uh, who are on our NCDE Information Education and Outreach Subcommittee. Um, and so um, when I took over that role uh, a couple years ago, you know, it was, it's such a big, um, effort to try to wrap your arms around and, and tackle. And so the goal we really set out for was to try to find issues that um, are kind of prevalent across uh, national forest, what our bear specialists are dealing with with fish, wildlife and parks, uh, what, you know, is just kind of a consistent issue um, across all agencies um, efforts and lands. And so um, we've made some progress on that. I think, you know, hopefully, we're going to make more progress this year with it and that's where the sub uh, or this uh, summit really helped because sometimes with this stuff it's just hard to even identify what are some action items that we can tackle because you know information education outreach is such a high level um, thing it's hard to find out what's something on the ground that's going to make a difference and like we've said before it's the folks in the field on the ground that really do make the most difference i think um uh, we, we print a ton of brochures and we've backed off that a little bit just because we've found that, you know, in this day and age, printed brochures maybe aren't always going to be the most effective or cost effective uh, way to 
promote education or information. We're, we're not completely eliminating those, but we've really taken a hard look at uh, what are we all saying in these brochures and where are they still effective and where can we maybe find some new strategies? And that's what led us to really identify the website, uh, the IGBC website as a, as a tool that we can hopefully improve upon. And um, Kate Smith with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has really uh, taken the lead on that and helped me go through the IGBC website and update that um, and find ways to make it a simple, easy to use website with educational resources. There's obviously the bear resistant product section, which is uh, viewed a few thousand times each month. It gets a lot of traffic and that's obviously a very important resource um, that Patty Soka runs uh, through uh, Wildlife Management Institute. Um, but, you know, a credit to our, uh, the subcommittee members, especially Amy, you know, she's really uh, reminded me again and again that we need to take a really focused effort on consistency and messaging and what are these, um, what are these common issues across the ecosystem? So hopefully we'll, we'll really kind of fine tune focus on that. Um, and it looks like we have Jeff Mao joining, so I'm gonna promote him real quick. Um, so I'll share my screen real quick and show you uh, um, some information on the Information Education Summit. Um, and let's see if I can do that now. Okay. So did that come up all right for everybody? Can you kind of see my, my page? Yeah, we can see that, Dylan. Okay. Although so it's it's in, uh, doesn't appear to be in a full screen, but maybe that's what you're intending. There we go. There we go. Um, so to totally uh, just use the hard work of Daniel Euler here, she was really involved in that summit that we put on this summer. Uh, Daniel Euler, who's the INE chair for the Yellowstone, Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem. Um, her and Sarah Silty really deserve a ton of credit for organizing this summit uh, that happened, there you go, in January. Um, and in a relatively short amount of time, they threw it together and it was in Helena. And we had a ton of uh, folks, I think over 100 um, attendees from across Montana came to Helena for this uh, information education outreach summit. Um, and you can kind of see right there, I mean, the goal was really to try to get everybody we could in one room uh, who are involved in grizzly bear conservation and recovery and then education, safety, um, outreach, um, and just to try to get people in the same room because there, as we found out really quickly, there's a ton of efforts going on across Montana. Um, and so sometimes though, like, me not reinventing this great presentation that Danielle did, we're kind of all doing our own things and why repeat efforts when there's really good work that's already being done. And so trying to just connect those dots was I think the primary goal of that um, summit. And it, I think it really worked out well. So um, we had uh, you know, NGOs, agencies, tribes, uh, private companies, we you know come to this summit and participate and listen. And we had great panel discussions. Um, and it was just super helpful, as well as uh, members of the Governor's Grizzly Bear Advisory Council, which um, I don't want to steal Heather's thunder. Um, she'll be speaking next about that uh, council, but it's uh, I've been helping with that and just to, to learn a ton from that process and get those uh, folks on the council kind of um, filled in on all the work that's being done. So, um, you know, it's kind of the first night trade show. Um, everybody had tables they set up and that's where we really quickly learned how many brochures are being printed every year and that maybe that's not necessarily uh, necessary to keep printing more and more of them. Um, but uh, good panel discussions, um, different themes were kind of identified, uh, particularly, you know, where is there a lot of work being done and where are there areas that there isn't work being done that we maybe need to really focus on and, um, and that le led to for example, you know, even in our area, you know, in the Eureka area, maybe we need to devote a little more uh, attention and resources to um, areas that are maybe becoming more uh, bear aware needed. And uh, so trying to find where should we put more resources. Um, I'll kind of go down here. This is kind of the, I think the big ones, the kind of some of the action items or, or recommendations that we came out of this uh, was that the clearinghouse for messaging and, th and that's what the website I think can be. Um, so we've worked on kind of a project proposal for the IGBC website um, and taken some of the stuff we learned at this summit 
and, and put it into um, a project proposal. We're going to go out. I'm not sure where Lori Roberts might know more on where that might go, but hopefully we'll get a firm that will go in and redesign and redevelop and restructure the IGBC website, because that really, I think, has a good opportunity to be the go-to source for everything, bear awareness, um, res educational resources, you know, for the NGOs who are saying, hey, we want the right messaging, but what is that? Where do I get that? Right now, there's not really a lot of easy to find places where you can get that information. So the IGBC website seems like a, a perfect opportunity for that clearinghouse for information. So um, I will, you know, this, uh, the, the various audiences, I think it's, uh, it's really important to know who you're trying to connect with, uh, you know, the messaging and this, you know, working together, it, you need to know who you're working with and, and, and the unique challenges they're faced with and unique issues they're faced with. Um, it, it's not a one size fits all approach when it comes to working together uh, in any shape or form, whether it's management, but it, particularly in education and, and outreach, you know, you, so trying to identify those specific um, groups or landscapes that have unique challenges, then you can address them appropriately. So that was a big takeaway um, from this summit. Um, yeah, I, I know Daniel did a great job on this presentation. So I'd say it's on our IGBC website. If you want to kind of learn more about it, go check it out there. Um, on the Yellowstone ecosystem page. Um, and hopefully this will kind of really create some more momentum uh, and that uh, Lori and Kim have really helped get going. Um, and this time next year, hopefully we'll have a redesigned IGBC website, fingers crossed. And um, we'll be able to really make it easier for folks who are trying to find that information and, and those tools that they need in their uh, specific areas. Um, I'm sure I'm forgetting something Amy or Lori, is there anything I, I missed that you'd want to chime in on? No, I think you did a good job, Dylan. Um, oh, I forgot to mention, Amy specifically has been working on some fast-paced recreation signage. Speaking of signage that, you know, is really needed right now, um, she uh, really championed that effort for Flathead National Forest. and got some good clean messaging uh, figured out that we'll hopefully be able to utilize uh, anywhere where it's appropriate to really try to target, like we talked about specific audiences. Well, mountain bikers um, you know, are an increased audience that we really need to get information and education to. So uh, kudos to Amy Jacobs for spearheading that effort. And I believe those signs are being printed in put out there, but I can't remember. I saw a digital version of it and it's, and it's very well done. So those are the kind of um, teamwork projects we're hoping to kind of do at a larger scale. So um, with that, I let me see here, I will uh, stop sharing. And I guess if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Great, thanks Dylan. I want to, I guess um, I'll avoid too much comment, but I do want to uh, identify a parallel, which I thought was interesting, which was we held, um, boy, now it might be a year and a half ago, maybe a little longer. We also um, in Helena held a transportation summit. And at that transportation summit, um, there were some really interesting common things that came from that. One is just the the, the way that the agencies and NGOs and other partners joined at that summit together. Um, it, it wasn't, um, as you've identified and maybe some of your objectives out of that summit, it wasn't that the agencies were coming up with messaging and, and delivering that back to the public or the audiences as much as including the audiences, but also the, the, the NGO and the, the benefit of having um, everybody together in the room at once coming up with that stuff, which I thought was, was really, really cool in our transportation summit and I see that same energy identified here. The other was um, the uh, momentum building um, in pulling everybody together in the same place and the transportation summit did that as well. Somehow getting all those people in one place does um, help build a lot of momentum around some common ideas. And then coming up with those priority outreach goals, um, 
just it's hard at times with 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 the diffuse nature in the way that the information and education is being handled in so many places there is no easy way to get all that in one place and understand what the priorities are um, but these summits really help serve that purpose well so just hats off to you and the and the conveners of that summit they pulled that off in a miraculously short amount of time and the attendance was um, indicative of the interest of the topic so just really really proud of you guys and really glad that you did that um, if any other comments on the education outreach? Randy, I would mention anyone out there who has uh, staff that would be good uh, to have on our information education outreach committee, please send them my way. I, I'd love for that to be as all encompassing as we can. And just to make sure that we are um, cued into the different agency um, um, perspectives. And so, uh, please let, if you have anybody you want to nominate, we're always looking to recruit new members. Great. Thanks, Dylan. I want to take a couple seconds here just to recognize a couple folks who have joined us. Um, and in doing so, for those of you joining us, I'll, I'll uh, call on you just to unmute. And if you've got video, um, allow us to see you for a minute. Proof of life. Um, Jeff, do you want to introduce yourself really quick? Sure, Jeff Mao here, Superintendent, Glacier National Park. And uh, yep, just uh, sorry I'm late, uh, but just trying to figure out how to reopen the park. Yeah, you've, uh, like many of us, have full-time jobs, so very much appreciate you joining us. Thanks, Jeff. And we also, I think we see um, Whisper Means joined us, if she wants to say hello. Hello, I'm here. Sorry, I was watching on the other link, and so I figured I better come in here and be part of the group. Well, thank you for joining us. Very much appreciate that. All right, with that, I think I'll turn to uh, Heather Stokes. Good morning, everyone. Thanks again for inviting me to share an update on the Governor's Grizzly Bear Advisory Council. Um, my name is Heather Stokes and I'm co-facilitator of the council with my colleague Sean Johnson and we are with the Center for Natural Resources and Environmental Policy which is housed at the University of Montana. And just I know a number of you are, are quite intimately involved with the council's work but for those of you that um, either haven't heard an update since I last shared it in December or haven't heard anything at all to sort of provide a, a brief overview of the council. And they are 18 Montana citizens representing a diverse geography throughout Montana, as well as experiences and interests around um, grizzly bear conservation and management. They were appointed by the governor's office back in late August and started meeting pretty much on a monthly basis since last October. However, in the last couple of months, um, despite COVID-19, they've been meeting much more frequently, both as a large council via Zoom and in their working groups via Zoom and teleconference. So despite um, their disappointment of not getting to see each other in person, they're quite grateful for having had the opportunity to meet in person at the beginning to really help develop their relationships. And the technology that's been available has really helped progress their work over these last few months. The purpose of the council when it was originally formed is to develop recommendations for guidance and direction on key issues and challenges related to conservation and management of grizzly bears in Montana, particularly those issues where there's significant social disagreement. The details of their charge can be found in their executive order from the governor's office, which is on the FWP website. If you Google Governor's Grizzly Bear Advisory Council Montana, it'll take you straight to the page. And on that page, in addition to the executive order, which really goes through broad strategic objectives around wanting to make sure that they're taking into consideration, maintaining and enhancing human safety, ensuring a healthy and sustainable grizzly bear population, improving timely and effective response to conflicts involving grizzly bears, engaging all partners in grizzly related outreach and conflict prevention, and recommendations around improving intergovernmental, interagency and tribal coordination. They've also been tasked with seven topic areas, but certainly 
definitely not limited to these topic areas, but wanting to make sure that they've had presentations, content information, updates on grizzly bear distribution within Montana, taking into con uh, consideration connectivity between ecosystems, conflict response, response protocols to grizzly conflict in different parts of the state, transplant protocols, the role of hunting, and resources for long-term sustainability. So initially in the first couple of months, especially, their focus was really on developing relationships with each other, hearing and understanding different perspectives from uh, themselves on the council, as well as getting presentations from a number of content experts, both on the support team, as well as from NGOs and other entities um, that have information on, on grizzly bears. Just to back up in terms of the support team to the council, the council members don't necessarily have expertise around content with grizzly bears, although there are a number that do. So FWP put together a support team and we've had really great interactive participation from folks at FWP, US Fish and Wildlife, USGS, Forest Service, Wildlife Services, Blackfeet Tribe, CSKT Tribe, um, and many others that have been very involved in just wanting to provide support and information to the council. They've also at this point received, Dylan, I think we're probably close to 10,000 public comments. So Dylan and Vivica at FWP have been making sure that the council has had access to all the public comments that have come in. And periodically, um, Dylan and Vivica have PDF those comments and those can be found on the council website as well. Since we've gone to video in March, all of those were live streamed for the public and then subsequently um, recorded and posted online. So if you're really interested in backtracking and seeing those conversations firsthand, you can go and, and um, sit through great video and. Um, Hopefully, I haven't done that since I've sat through all the meetings, but um, all of that is there if, if you're looking to catch up. Really what, um, in addition to the seven topic areas that they've also had conversation and specific presentations on has been around social tolerance and compensation and incentive programs for landowners. So those were two topic areas that have been of particular interest to the council where they wanted to have specific presentation and specific dedicated time for discussion in addition again to those seven topic areas I just mentioned. The focus really in the last month or so has been around the council coming up with articulating and synthesizing all of their thoughts and ideas that they've been generating for the last several months They've been in working groups since January where they've really been um, putting those ideas in writing and they've gone back and forth <clears throat> from those four working group documents into consolidating those documents into one. There's been a couple of iterations of those. Again, if, if you want to take a look at just sort of their brainstorming session. So it's it's been quite messy for those that haven't been an intimate part of the process. And even for those of us that have been part of it, it, it has felt and seems quite messy. However, they've made incredible progress in synthesizing those ideas. And now in the last um, month, they've really been taking a step back and looking at their overall vision for what these recommendations are going to be. Um, used in sort of setting that path forward. And so their vision discussion summary where they've gone through a couple of iterations that was just posted from our May 26th meeting just um, earlier this week. So that can be found online as well. We are with the governor moving into phase two starting June 1st. We are planning on a coming back face to face for our next meeting June 8th and 9th which will be focused again on trying to solidify a vision statement and looking at where we really need to have continued conversation where there's um, 
still questions or not necessarily agreement on certain areas and how that will get conveyed and reflected in their recommendations and report to the governor. And also really looking at where have they identified consensus and common ground and how to put that together with context for the recommendations report. So we really are looking at meeting the timeline of having a final draft report to the governor's office in August. So with that, one more comment about um, public engagement. We have had all sorts of um, really interactive public engagement up through our February meeting where we were able to meet in person and welcome the public in person, involving them in breakout groups, small group discussions, ample opportunity for public comment and questions and discussion with council members. At this point, since we turned to video, we've live streamed all of the meetings and then Dylan and Vivica were standing by and we had indicated that while we weren't able to integrate them into the video portion, if they submitted questions through the public comment, we offered opportunities to share those questions live. So we've been doing the best we possibly can um, given the, the circumstances of COVID-19. So with that, I'll stop and see if there are any questions or comments from folks. All right, um, pausing just long enough to see if anybody's got some thoughts for Heather on the Grizzly Bear Advisory Council. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Heather. Really appreciate it. Um, the update's helpful for sure. I know I had a lot of questions from, um, from folks coming to in Reading and we're preparing for this meeting about where the, the governor's advisory council was. Um, and I know that it's been daunting through this uh, COVID times, um, but uh, working regularly with Dylan and Vivica have had a front row seat to the work that's been going in behind the scenes to make sure these things keep happening. And hats off to you guys. That was, it's been a huge effort to keep everybody engaged and so, so happy that the council members themselves have been so interested in staying as engaged as they have been and giving this a lot of time and energy. So um, huge amount of work and look forward to your next meetings as well as some of that um, summative stuff that you'll have by August, it sounds like. Thanks, Randy. Pretty impressed with the council and the work that they've done. They're quite a committed group. So i um, quite honored to work with them. And, and hopefully you guys will take a look at their work on the website and feel free to reach out if you've got any questions. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for that additional reminder that that's available for folks to take a look at um, and follow that bouncing ball as those pieces come together and provide some input as, as you have it. So great. Thank you very much, Heather. Thanks, Randy. So with that, I see following our agenda, um, we'll move to Hillary Cooley. Okay, thanks, Randy. I'm gonna try and share my screen. Let's see, share. Okay, you see my screen up here? Yeah, we've got you, Hillary. Great, okay. Thanks, Randy. Um, I was asked to give an update on a task that each of these uh, subcommittees were given what well, was about a year and a half ago by the IGBC Executive Committee. Um, and this task was basically for each subcommittee, the Yellowstone Ecosystem, Northern Continental Divide, and the Selkirk Cavity Act Combined Committee to review their um, recent trends in, in conflict and mortality and give a, um, a good review of what the mortality sources were and um, come up with some recommendations to try and stem some of those, what can be stemmed and, and come up with some proposals for how we can address those trends. And so these were the specific tasks. I'm gonna walk through here, just to remind you, this is what the um, IGBC asked us to do. We first came up with a preliminary list of issues. And so for the NCDE subcommittee, there was a small working group of people who reviewed um, the recent mortality trends. And we actually compared to the, I believe it was, a, we looked at about a 10 year window or some different time periods. And we compared earlier trends to more recent trends. And 
tried to identify where some of the major differences were. Um, and we came up with a preliminary list. In December at the IGBC meeting, we produced a report with uh, kind of finalizing the list of issues and coming up with a, some preliminary recommendations to address those issues. And the next task for June, coming up quick, is to develop a final Im implementation strategy. So I, I know that this, all of the subcommittees are kind of struggling here with what does this mean and how are we going to do this. Uh, I try to attend all of the subcommittee meetings and so I'm, I'm up on what's, what the other guys have been doing basically. And there are a lot of issues that are similar or, at, or the same in each of the ecosystems. Add to that, we've got bears moving in between ecosystems and so um, the advisors to IGBC kind of recognized and have been talking with uh, Martha Williams, who's the chair of IGBC right now, about tackling this at the IGBC level, where we're looking at it across ecosystems. And so we're going to be doing that at IGBC, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. First, I just wanted to quickly remind people what we came up with as, the, as a subcommittee for the NCDE. I'll give a quick summary of what the other ecosystems have done so you get a feeling for the similarities and differences. So our priority list, we went through the, the data for NCDE and these were the top four um, sources of mortality and the, the main priorities we thought we could focus on. You know, there are other mortalities, for instance, livestock related that we definitely noticed is, you know, right up there in terms of mortalities. You saw that in Cecily's report, management removals. Um, but we really wanted to tackle the ones that were uh, responsible for high levels of mortality, but were also something that we felt we could really address. So we came up with some of those recommendations targeted at each one of those. I won't go through every one of these. I just kind of summarized. There's a lot of information education programs targeting it specifically at different groups, some mitigation work related to railroad collisions and vehicle collisions. And then we have an awful lot of site related conflict, um, small livestock waste management, and so we have some uh, ideas in the report related to that as well. Our group also came up with some overarching recommendations. Um, you know, it, these, are, these are big issues and especially with population that is expanding, they're not, they're not things that we're going to um, address immediately and solve right off the bat. And so we, really thought we need some long-term working groups to put our heads together and continue working on these issues. And, you know, making sure we're responsible uh, to, to continuing to work on these things. We also recognize that some of these things could benefit from external representatives. So the group was formed of agency reps, but for instance, we've noticed that shooting related mortalities um, are something we would like to address and maybe it would be beneficial to have somebody from the hunting community on there or from the waste management company. Um, and then we identified, I mentioned this earlier, but we need to coordinate among ecosystems where we have similarities and overlap. So for the Yellowstone ecosystem, they came up with five priority issues. Each of these three ecosystems came at things a little bit differently. So you'll notice that, um, but they kind of bend into these five categories, backcountry rec and hunting related, then front country conflicts and community planning. They really felt like information and education is going on um, all over the place, but it, it's, we don't know what's effective and what's not. We're, we're putting a lot of money and effort towards it but we don't really know how effective it is. Livestock conflicts and producer outreach, and then targeted community outreach in those expansion areas. And so they came up with these issues. Um, then at their fall meeting in Cody, they, 
had, they put on a public workshop and it was really well attended. They did a, a very nice job of organizing this. David Diamond organized and facilitated this probably maybe, I wanna say a hundred attendees from the community came and had brainstorming sessions. Basically we had each one of these issues was on a piece of paper and you go and sit at that table if you're most interested in the livestock conflicts. Producers that were attending would probably go to that table and brainstorm on ways to reduce conflicts and mortality related to each one of those. It was, um, it was a really big success. And so we came out with um, a whole bunch of <laughs> ideas and thoughts and some were out there and some were um, really helpful. And so right now they're trying to figure out how to take that and move it in, you know, how, how do we put that into play? What do we do with that now? So uh, here again, I won't go through each one of these. I just kind of listed out some of the things that they came up with um, to, to reduce mortalities and conflict in each one of these uh, areas. So, you know, information education, waste management, um, uh, signage, a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of similarities between the NCDE and the GYE. And then the Selkirk County Yak, uh, you know, many fewer bears here and they don't have a whole lot of conflicts yet but they do have a few and they have mortality that's going on. And so these are their top causes of human cause mortality, mistaken ID, defense of life, poaching, and train and automobile collisions. And they came up with some recommendations um, targeted at reducing those mortalities. So all of those are issues in our, in the NCDE actually. So um, this summer, we're gonna have the IGBC meeting. If for those who don't know yet, it will be virtual. Um, there is a full day meeting on June 24th. We don't have all the details yet, but as part of that, the advisors to IGBC have been planning the agenda and trying to figure out um, how to distill three-day meeting to, into, into a one-day meeting. One of the items on our list to tackle was this uh, mortality conflict trend task that IGBC gave us. Um, and I think what we're gonna do, although we're still working out the details, I think we're gonna have a second IGBC meeting on J July 24th just so that we have a good amount of time to dedicate to this. And between now and then, there, the IGBC advisors will be working with a small group of others who had been involved in the reports from each, report, each subcommittee to discuss and come up with a proposal to how do we implement this at an ecosystem level, given that so many of the issues are similar. And so we are trying to schedule that meeting right now and um, you will find out more if you tune in to IGBC this summer. And Randy, that's all I have, um, but happy to answer questions. Great, thanks, um, Hillary. That's really helpful and helpful for me as well, um, given that I've got um, some responsibilities and as the chair and sharing some of those um, outcomes of the, of the mortality subcommittee. And also as I'm plugging into the scheduled stuff that David Diamond's pulling together this summer, it was nice for me to get that summary of what the expectations are and very much appreciate um, the recognition that there's a lot of similarity um, between the subcommittees. And I, I think I'm really looking forward to those next meetings. I think that's gonna really help. So I'll, um, I'll look to see if we've got questions from members, subcommittee members. So Hillary, um, if you would um, maybe see if you can drop your screen. Thank you. So 
I'm looking at our agenda and I need some input from, from you guys who are participating here as panelists. So we do have, um, just for your awareness, we have about uh, 40 minutes um, before we were gonna take a break for lunch according to our agenda. Um, Kathy Ake was scheduled to go on at one, but we don't have her plugged in yet. Um, I know we have some of our bear specialists on, but what I'm balancing right now is that we have approximately 30 people following us on YouTube. And I know that our posted agenda had topics starting at one o'clock. And uh, so I'm balancing the fairness to those, both our presenters who may not be available until after lunch, as well as our public who expected to be able to join in and see those agenda items at certain times. If this were a meeting, um, at a hotel or a convention location like we've traditionally done, then generally I feel pretty comfortable moving the agenda because we kind of have a captive audience for the day usually. But given that we're uh, virtual and people can plug in and leave as they would like and try to follow the agenda, I feel um, a little reluctant to shift the agenda too much. So what I'm proposing is that um, unless I hear some other suggestions, which I'm certainly open to, um, that we actually break early and just give folks a, an extended lunch break, get some other business done and then reconvene at one. But want to hear from others how you're feeling about that, if it's worth trying to bring, um, move the agenda and bring some items up front. So, Bill? Yeah, Randy, I support your proposal. Thank you. Okay, any others, other suggestions on, on shifting agenda or how we might handle this extra 40 minutes? I'm supportive of your proposal, Randy, thanks. Hey, Randy, this is uh, Jeff Mao, and I, I do have to leave at two, um, and I don't have a lot to share as a park update, um, but obviously I missed that sort of three to four period you were looking for, I think, or or maybe it was a two to three period. But... I'd, I'd welcome your update now, Jeff, so we can get it while, catch you while we have you, um, if that works for you. Sure. And, uh, you know, again, it's, uh, yeah, you know, I, I missed uh, last fall's NCD meeting. So it's uh, great to sort of uh, get back in the saddle and, and, and hear about some of these things. But, you know, um, just to reflect on last year uh, was the second busiest year on record for Glacier National Park. So we definitely had high levels of visitation. Um, you know, was sort of the interesting pattern. I think we're starting, at least what we were starting to see was the shift in visitation that occurs uh, with a number of years of wildfires occurring in August and September because uh, our July was much busier than our August was. And so uh, we saw that reflected in, in some of the activity uh, around the park. And uh, Obviously, um, this year is going to look very, very different, or we anticipate it will look very, very different. Um, obviously, the uh, I, I think there's going to be a lot of uh, local or Montana-based travel to the park, so uh, we know there's a, a lot of pent-up desire there. But on the other hand, our destination visitors, the ones that come from out of state, uh, particularly by air, airlines, are, are going to be greatly reduced, um, and uh, I a state fairly active with the chambers and trying to get a feel for what they're seeing. I think it's very questionable as to what that visitation will be like for those that are sort of 600 miles or further from, from, from Glacier. So yes, there does seem to be an appetite for more road-based touring uh, this year from the public, but again, um, it's a long way to Glacier for, for, from a lot of those populated areas. So, so we'll wait and see. Um, how that plays out, I've sort of wondered about, you know, again, you know, with 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 the lack of human activity, uh, particularly during the the closure period, um, uh, you know, what what opportunities have that provided for? Um, we're also up against, uh, you know, the the U.S. Canada border being closed, um, and that being extended to uh, June 21st at this point. So. Um, again, you know, I think that that reduces significantly the amount of, of human activity in, in, across that landscape. And of course, the Blackfeet yesterday in their tribal council meeting uh, decided to continue their prohibition for non-essential non traffic across the uh, reservation, which to this point, we've uh, 
we've it essentially has meant that that all our venues on the east side of the park are closed or we've kept them closed and we'll probably do so as we con continue throughout june so again i just think there's um you know that that the, the, uh human activity uh across the landscape has has changed quite a bit um and, and again, I don't know what it means for, for grizzly bears, but it is just something to, to note and uh, uh, we'll, be, we'll be watching that. When we do reopen, I will say that uh, we won't have nearly the level of uh, activities available in the park simply because of the reduced staffing, the uh, increased, um, and that reduced staffing is due to this, this requirement we have that every seasonal employee have their own bedroom. And, and we've never sort of uh, done that, not had dorm style uh, um, housing available in the past. So it's reduced our staffing. It's also the increased activities required for sanitation of public restrooms. And of course, national parks are full of public uh, facilities. So um, we're going to have our hands full just trying to keep the going to the sun road open, uh, providing uh, trails and then providing um, uh, a handful of visitor centers and, and we're only going to open two campgrounds at least to start. We may be able to add a third as the summer goes on. So again, camping as a human activity will be greatly reduced uh, in Glacier National Park this year, which means, you know, we often talk about how you squeeze the balloon and it bubbles out somewhere else. Again, you know, how does this sort of uh, relate as, as with visitation and reduced opportunity in the park? You know, will we drive people out uh, to, to the outlying areas or will, we'll, you know, we'll just won't see as much activity. So I, you know, I think it'll be a very interesting dynamic moving forward. You know, certainly Kurt and Jim Williams may have some sense of of how this year's activity compares to last year, but my sense is it's up quite a bit. But again, there's a lot of that sort of pent up energy. Um, we watch Yellowstone quite a bit. I was just on the phone with Cam Shawley uh, earlier today, and and you know the Yellowstone with their Wyoming entrances first opening up uh, started with a lot of uh, there was there there was that sort of initial activity which was pretty busy but since then it's calmed down quite a bit and and they're only seeing and of course with only Wyoming entrances open 19 percent or 20 percent of of what they would normally see at this time in terms of visitation so we'll see how that switches over um, come um, June one and uh, again uh, Yellowstone is also reducing quite a bit the uh, opportunities for visitors. Uh, in Yellowstone. So, so again, you may not have, you're certainly not going to have the overnight um, activity that, that they've had traditionally. So I think it's just going to be a very, very interesting time uh, uh, this summer to watch and see um, what, are, what happens with, with some of our populations uh, like grizzly bears. So I'll leave it at that and see if anybody has questions, if you want to take questions. Yeah, you bet, Jeff. Any questions for Jeff while we have him? I mean, I will say that, uh, you know, it's been, um, I was just, my comments were very focused on sort of thinking about it from uh, the habitat and, and wildlife perspective. I'll just tell you on the human perspective, um, you know, I, as the National Park Service, we're just into some things we, we've, we've uh, never been before, talking about doing surveillance testing of asymptomatic individuals in the parks, uh, again, because the parks are going to be such a focus for out-of-state visitors um, that this working with the state, the tribes, and, and the county health, um, we're going to be um, testing a lot of uh, our staff uh, and other staff that have a lot of uh, contact with, with uh, outside visitors. And it'll be very, very interesting to, to see um, what, what's going on and, and understanding the movement of, of COVID-19 uh, as related you know, for Montana and, and, and the rest of the country, so. Great, 
Great. Thanks, Jeffrey. I really appreciate hearing from you and, um, and what you guys are doing, managing both the COVID, but also um, thanks for relating it to what a lot of us have been thinking about um, with how does this affect grizzly bears? Or, and it will be a really interesting opportunity to see what does the complete lack of public uh, recreation and to the park for a while mean and what did we see and versus what happens as you start to open it up in a soft way with a reduced capacities and stuff during the summer. It'll be really cool to see and interesting opportunity. So any questions for Jeff from anybody? Great, thanks Jeff for offering to, to go early. Very glad that you did that. Great, thanks. Um, I'd, I'd offer similarly to others, um, just now aware that we might have others who might be in a similar situation. Um, and if we do have anybody who feels that they need to go now for, or we will miss them this afternoon, it'd be great to hear from you. Otherwise we will um, reconvene at one. But first, let's see if we've got folks. Kurt? Yeah, I should probably go just in case I'm not able to make it back in time. You bet. Um, and I'll, I'll be brief. We are seeing, kind of tearing off of what Jeff said, we definitely are seeing an increased use, above average use on the National Forest, um, at least the Flathead National Forest, compared to uh, this time of year uh, normally, partly because the parks closed down. Uh, folks are staying at home, so we're getting a lot more influx of that local use. Uh, we haven't seen a ton of of the out of state, of course, with the governor's orders and whatnot, but in general, uh, definitely seeing a, an increased local use out in the in the forest in our developed campgrounds and dispersed camping uh, alike. So um, has been some decent bear activity. I'm sure Jim can give an update on that, um, some relocations and whatnot, but, but uh, Overall, I think things are going going really well. This is my first year here, so I don't know exactly what the norm is. So I'm I'm uh, fine tuning what that looks like, but uh, things are progressing forward. In terms of the other update, I would give is is we did push out our special use permits um, for marathons and some of our um, commercial guiding uh, for stuff like uh, mountain biking and ATVing. And we did that in a batched group this year, uh, where I think we had 14 uh, special use permits that we sent out all at one time, trying a different approach to gain some efficiencies. Uh, had a lot of controversy uh, with that approach. We'll, as, we'll talk internally and, and decide if that's the approach we wanna continue. But uh, similar concerns from what I heard from last year, of course, uh, in terms of bears with marathons, and any kind of uh, biking type use out there that that increases the bear and human conflict or the potential for that. So we are getting um, um, public input uh, regarding that, which, which was expected. So I think that's it. Uh, I can give a lot more uh, of what's going on in the forest. Don't know how how much you want to go in depth with that, but that's related to, to bears, kind of the highlights that came to my mind. Great, thanks, Kurt. Thanks for your flexibility for jumping in now. Any questions for Kurt? And maybe Bill, if there's something that we normally share as the as an agency, if you're still on, you could cue me in to, to share something that maybe I missed, Bill Avey. You might have to step away. Yep, no, no problem. So, um, yeah, and we will have uh, another chance to hear from Bill and those guys. And I don't, um, as far as your report out, Kurt, that um, sounds great. Really appreciate the updates. And um, unless others have questions, we're also going to be hearing from the specialists this afternoon on some of the bear specific um, issues that we've seen this spring. Um, and again, welcome to the NCDE subcommittee. Really glad you were able to join us. Hopefully, we get to meet you in person one of these months. Yep. Um, turning it back to the group, one last offer or the next offer for someone else who feels that they should present now for they won't be able to join us this afternoon. Okay, so with that, um, what I'm proposing is that we, um, we break for what now is about an hour and a half lunch 
will reconvene at one o'clock. I encourage you to come back early so that we can um, get connected and make sure we don't have any te technical difficulties. And when we reconvene, um, we'll ask Dylan to give another kind of brief introduction to the process and expectations for public um, as we will be getting closer to the public comment period. And then we'll roll right in um, with this afternoon in uh, probably rolling right to bear specialists. So if you look at your agenda, you'll see that our one o'clock was um, habitat monitoring with Kathy Ake. Um, Kathy's not available as I understand it now. So um, at that time slot, I am gonna give it a little bit of an update um, to where I believe we landed, but know that Kathy can um, look back to each of you um, regarding the reporting requirements for that, the habitat. So um, with that, I'm gonna pause one last time to see if anybody has any information for the good of the group before we break for lunch and before we see you back at a little before one o'clock. Randy, did you mean we're going to resume? Yeah, what, did I say something about canceling the meeting or? <laughs> <laughs> no, just that. play on words, resume. Oh, yes, resume. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> yeah, we will uh, repeat our Zoom efforts uh, starting at a little shy one o'clock. And so um, everybody enjoy your lunch. I know Jim Williams said he was going to take a run. So when he comes back, we'll check in with Jim and see how he did. And um, if others are recreating, take advantage of this beautiful Friday lunch period, and we'll see everybody just shy of one o'clock. And thanks for joining us this morning.
All right, welcome back everyone. Give folks a few minutes to reacquaint themselves with their screens, including myself. All right, so we're streaming live again. It's uh, now one o'clock and I just wanna welcome everybody back um, after lunch. So again, my name is Randy Arnold and I am the regional supervisor for Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks in Missoula and the chair of the Northern Continental Divide Ecosystem Subcommittee. And um, according to our agenda, um, we will be this afternoon uh, revisiting some work that Kathy Ake was doing on habitat monitoring. And Kathy's not able to join us, but I do have an update from her that I can share. And then we'll turn it over to our bear specialists, um, those who are available to give a kind of a spring capture of what's going on with activities of grizzly bears this spring. And then we'll turn it to a roundtable discussion for those who have some updates from their different um, tribes and agencies. And then um, at the end, provide an opportunity for public comment. So as a reminder, we are streaming live on YouTube, the pu public comment period towards the end. Uh, we will look to those who want to provide comment um, to call in and um, Dylan can explain that process when we get to that step. And um, Dylan, I'm going to turn it to you for just a second to see if you have any technical updates before we get rolling. Uh, no, Randy, appreciate it. Uh, yeah, it looks like we've got most everybody back in to the meeting um, and instructions for the public who want to participate this afternoon are on the IGBC website under the meetings uh, section. And there's a phone number to call in and enter that information and we'll be able to queue them up to provide input. Um, I did, uh, you know, just as an update on this morning's, you know, loaded Cecily's presentation uh, onto the IGBC website. I will uh, do a quick share screen to show you where for folks who wanna know how to find it. Um, if you go to the IGBC website um, and you go over here to the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem. Uh, Kate and I have been trying to go through and get all the updated reports from each of the ecosystems loaded onto the websites. Um, so please, if anyone out there has new reports you'd like to add, send them my way and we'll get them loaded. So each of these ecosystem subcommittee pages have the membership list um, and then meeting summaries and then uh, kind of pertinent reports. So here's the conservation strategy, for example, for the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem. Uh, I did make some uh, grammatical edits quite a bit, uh, thanks to some keen editorial eyes from uh, Kathy Ake particularly. And so those edits have been made to the conservation strategy. And then a summary of those edits, what changes I made are in this document right here that's a summary of editorial changes. And so anytime there's a uh, correction or clarification that needs to be made to the conservation strategy, um, I'll make that edit and then I will summarize it in this document. Um, but then management research reports are all right here. Um, this is certainly an incomplete list, but we're trying to collect as many as we can and have them here. You can see some recent years of Tim Manley's uh, annual grizzly bear management reports. Uh, I got a Wesley Sarmento's region four report from 2019 and still trying to collect all of those. And this would be a great place to put that. And Cecily's report from this morning is right here, the trend monitoring program. So anybody who wants to go back and review uh, the great stuff that Cecily presented, that is right here. So um, again, any website uh, additions or edits, please let me know. Thanks. And I will stop sharing. Great. Thanks, Dylan. Um, so we did have, and I think it, let me first check before I dive into this, down this uh, path. Um, Kurt Steele, are you still with us? I see your name there. I'm just checking to see if you'd be able to answer a question that came up um, during lunch break. Yep. Thanks, Kurt. So, so the question that was asked, um, and just wanted to handle it while you were here, was in response to the 14 um, special permit applications and that you had pushed those out at once. And the question was, what does that mean? And will they occur later this year? So maybe some clarification uh, on that. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have them in front of me. <clears throat> um, the special use permits are anything from outfitter and guides to um, uh, special use permits for, for marathons. Uh, some of them are not going to occur because some of them were scheduled to occur in July. And uh, with the governor's reopening um, of being in phase two, 
of 50 people, uh, we can't accommodate that. So they had to maintain um, compliance with local and state regulations. Um, but we wanted to at least go through our process so that depending on where the governor was at, we would be able to issue the permit if we were in a place to do that uh, with a COVID environment. So some are moving forward, uh, some are not. Uh, you'd have to contact the individual specialist on on which ones uh, are moving forward, but the scoping period did close for those um, and and got quite a few comments uh, from the whole spectrum on those. So don't have the list in front of me, I can pull it up. It wouldn't take me that long to do that, but um, they're pretty minor special uses, but can create some controversy, obviously with bears and whatnot when you're adding that public interface there, which is why I brought it up. Okay, appreciate um, me letting you or um, you letting me put you on the spot. So thanks for the quick response there. And just wanted to see if we could give a little bit of an answer to that question that had been posed over the lunch period. So just wanted, uh, before I turn to our agenda, uh, just a quick pause to see if anybody in the group had any uh, business for, as, for the group as a whole before we roll into these agenda items. Just don't wanna miss anything there. Okay, thanks. So the, the next agenda item um, was from Kathy Ake. And if you guys uh, remember, we had um, it, we had finalized our conservation strategy uh, and had recognized that the conservation strategy is both a live document as time goes on and things change. But we were also addressing the fact that there were still editing things and items that popped up in the conservation strategies. And as Dylan just described, we have a process, um, a flow chart, if you will, on managing changes or edits to the conservation strategy. And those edits that are completely grammatical, we give Dylan Tabish, um, our chief editor, a little bit of literary license to make a decision that that is truly grammatical. If he has any question at all, he bounces that to the subcommittee as an ask of, hey, I think this is or it isn't. And if there's any question on that, then we bring it to the group as a whole to be discussed and consider the, the potential changes or ramifications to that. So um, as Dylan identified, he did make some edits to that and he is posting and tracking those on that summary document. So if there's any question as to the changes that he's made, that summary document would be able, um, it would be available to you. But as we were going through this, the other thing that popped up is that Kathy Ake and trying to make sure she was clear on the habitat standards um, did a big effort and had bumped into some problems um, comparing apples to apples between uh, AUMs and um, the uh, head months. And I've got so, an update from her. So I'm going to I'm not going to share this. I'm just trying to get to my notes from Kathy um, so I can report this out. So just pause here just a sec. So the, 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 at the December meeting, there was a loose decision or at least a decision of those who were present that shifting to the head months made a lot of sense. Um, as soon as that decision was made, as Kathy was trying to collect those figures, it became really clear to a lot of the agencies that were managing by AUM that that was a fairly um, uh, process heavy and or uh, time intensive effort to shift to head months. So uh, Kathy uh, reconnected with those agency folks and after a lot of conversation back and forth, um, fell back to the lowest common denominator, which was just continuing to track it as animal unit months. She wanted to emphasize that the, nothing's changing on the actual um, habitat impacts. It's just a matter of making sure that we're comparing apples to apples when we go back to the baseline to what we're managing now. And so with the decision um, circling back with the agencies to keep it at animal unit months, AUMs, she is now working on the edits to the conservation strategy to update that element. Um, she's also uh, working and making some minor edits to the conservation strategies appendix six to make it very clear the differences bet um, between the amendment 19 version and the conservation strategy version for motorized access analysis. So just pointing to a couple things there, um, largely from Kathy's perspective, um, the 2018 monitoring port report for NCDE developed recreation sites is done. And the 2019 monitoring port report for the NCDE motorized access is in progress and she reports is about half done. So some 
general updates regarding where she is on those monitoring reports, and then also that shift um, back to AUMs as the lowest common denominator for the agencies. So I'll, I'll pause there to see whether anybody tracked that or not, and how confusing that might be, and see if there's questions about that. Hey, thanks, Randy. Appreciate Kathy's work on that. My only um, comment, and, it, and it's a concern, but a, not a very large concern, is just ensuring that, that Kathy is tying back into Sean Heinert uh, of our regional office staff and Scott Jackson, since you're on that, on that call, if you could work just to facilitate that, just so we have a good definition since Today, the Forest Service uses head months where we used to use AUMs. Um, there's a clear crosswalk between those, those two values in the document so people can, can see that it's a different measure, but it's, 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 it's a different measure, um, but it's really not changing capacities. Yeah, I can do that, Bill. I, I talked to Sean um, a while back about that when, when some of these discussions were going around. So he's tracking, he's in contact with Kathy, but I'll double back with him and make sure that's true. Okay, awesome. Thank you very much. You bet. Great, thanks, Bill. And thanks, Scott, for circling back. I know um, it's not a, a common denominator for everybody on how we're tracking that stuff, but just trying to find something that's working and that, that crosswalk is an effort for somebody. So very much appreciate the time that goes into making sure that that happens. Um, any other questions regarding the, whether it's edits to the conservation strategy or specifically the habitat monitoring uh, reports and the work that Kathy's doing? And I may not be able to answer them, but at least see if there's anything there we need to, to loop back to Kathy. Okay, seeing none, um, what um, I think we'll do is shift to the bear specialist updates. And I, I wanna thank, um, Lori Roberts for helping me out behind the scenes there. I, I could have done some of this legwork to reach out to each of the specialists, but Lori offered and and um, very much appreciated that effort to get her get connected to the specialists. This is a very difficult time of year for them to be sitting on a meeting and providing this update. So also want to um, thank the specialists for carving out some time to join us as they are available and if they are available. Um, the purpose of gathering a um, information from the update or from the specialist today uh, wasn't necessarily to do our usual um, deeper dive, which is a collection usually in the fall of all of the uh, uh, conflict responses um, that they had dealt with over the entire season, but rather take advantage of the fact that our meeting was a little later than usual and we had responded to a lot of um, conflicts and things this year to date. Um, and it's been fairly active. And so I just uh, wanted to take advantage of that to see if there were some updates from specialists. So this will be more anecdotal, um, and I don't expect that the specialists will have any um, really fancy reports or presentations to give. If they do, great, uh, but don't certainly not expected. Um, and with that, looking at the agenda, I think I'll just follow by regions and um, see if maybe region one wants to start with uh, Tim and or Kim. See if my video quits scrolling. Yeah, you might have to do no video, Tim. It's definitely scrolling still for some reason. Yeah, I see that. Switching through. Okay, I'm gonna stop the video so I don't make people sick. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay. Um, Tim Manley, Fish, Wildlife and Parks for Region 1 uh, in the NCD portion of the grizzly bear management area. And um, I'm going to also give Kim Annis's update, brief update, because she is out releasing a grizzly bear today right now. She asked if I'd give an update if she didn't get back. So um, it's been a very busy spring and uh, I we were lucky to be able to bring back my technician, Justine Valiers. She started May 11th. We got funding through Montana Outdoor Legacy Foundation and, and appreciate Ken McDonald's help and, and uh, Karen Deering and 
Neil and Jim Williams and everybody in trying to get the funding pushed through for it. Um, so far, uh, since, um, well, basically the end of March, I've had over 63 calls related to grizzly bears. Of those 63, most of them were just reports of people seeing bears. We've had a lot of bears in the valley this spring so far. Out of the 63 uh, calls, 25 of them were recorded as conflicts of some type. And those conflicts uh, occurred in uh, Columbia Falls, Ferndale, Creston, Woods Bay, Swan Lake, Whitefish, Holland Lake campground areas. Um, I did set traps for some of these bears. We ended up, we so far to date, we've caught uh, eight different grizzly bears in my area. Uh, the first ones was a family group, female with three yearlings caught in the Columbia Falls area. And that was on April 24th. And uh, due to the, what the female and the family group was doing, um, and what they had been doing the previous fall, um, which was not getting reported to us, but it was basically bird feeders up on porches, getting into pig feed, getting into chicken feed, killing chickens. Uh, we ended up uh, starting off putting up electric fence to try to dissuade her from getting access to barns and chicken coops. Uh, but she was very persistent. We finally ended up capturing her and all three of her female yearlings decision was made to kill the adult female, which we did. And that hide is gonna be used either by Glacier Park or uh, the Glacier Institute for educational purposes. And I went to the taxidermist for that. Uh, one of her yearlings was injured when the trap door came down, when the mother was caught and it looks like it broke a bone on the foot of one of the female yearlings. We took her to the vet clinic, had it x-rayed and the decision based on the x-ray was made to, uh, to euthanize her, which we did. And um, the other two female yearlings were in good shape. And I did not have the money for radio collars at the time to put on those two yearlings, but we did release them after microchipping them. Uh, Glacier National Park allowed us to release them at Logging Creek in the North Fork of the Flathead. And we've gotten, um, we've heard a couple of reports of people seeing them uh, park personnel inside the park uh, since then, but uh, no conflicts or anything. And then uh, May 7th and 8th, uh, prior to that, we were getting numerous reports of three subadult grizzly bears in the Ferndale, uh, Swan Lake, Woods Bay area. These are the same three subadults that were seen last year in that same general area, but also were down at um, Yellow Bay along Flathead Lake and they were down at Finley Point. Stacy Corville uh, got reports of them down there. Um, they were not captured last year and uh, they re must have den together. They came out together and I started getting reports of them along Swan Lake uh, in yards feeding on grass, just telling people make them leave. And they ended up over in Woods Bay eventually along Flathead Lake, got into garbage that was unsecured got into bird feeders, um, became more aggressive in terms of their uh, selection, looking for more food, came over the top of the mountains, ended up over near Swan Lake. We were up on porches, getting bird feeders, garbage. We ended up capturing all three of them. They were all three years old, one male, two females. And we took um, the male and released them up near Moose City in the North Fork of the Flathead. And we kept the two females together and we released them in the North Fork of the Flathead at Whale Creek uh, in coordination with the Forest Service, Rob Davies. And um, all three of those bears basically went west over the top of the Whitefish Range and ended up in the Fort Tyne Trigo area. And Kim Annis is now covering Lincoln County. So she's covering the Fort Tyne Trigo striker area uh, area that I used to cover. We still coordinate, but she's covering it now. So she ended up uh, having to deal with this young male that came over the top. And she actually captured him and the because he was getting in the garbage, back of trucks, into garages. And that bear was killed uh, a week ago or so. And then um, uh, the two female grizzlies, um, have been around houses. They got into some bird, feeser, fe bird feeders around Dickey Lake and Trigo area and um, 
then they move south to Stryker, and right now they're south to Stryker on the in the Salish Range. So we're monitoring them with GPS collars, and hopefully they'll stay out of trouble. But so far, they have been visiting a few places where people have bird feeders up. And like I said, I'll give a little more report of what Kim's been dealing with. So um, then also yesterday um, on the 27th, uh, we set a trap for a subadult grizzly bear in Ferndale that had found some garbage that uh, somebody had left out. We don't know whose garbage it was, but it ended up on somebody else's property and she got into some dog food there. Uh, game warden uh, went out, tried to chase her away. She wouldn't leave. She would leave, but she came right back um, and right in amongst a bunch of houses. So Justine and I set a trap. We caught her in five hours. We worked her up yesterday and uh, she was a two-year-old female, 106 pounds, no previous capture. We put a GPS collar on her and coordinated with Rob Davies and Hillary Cooley and released her along the east side of Flathead or east side of uh, Hungry Horse Reservoir down at Deep Creek yesterday. Um, I also had three traps out for a family group in Ferndale, female with two yearlings. And uh, my technician, Justine, pulled those traps today. Those bears did not come back. So that's a quick overview of what I've been dealing with since the end of March. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and give you Kim's quick summary. And then if anybody has any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. We have been putting up critter getters, noisemakers. We've been putting up electric fencing, preventative type stuff. But uh, like I said, we've gotten a lot of calls. Oh, I'll mention Holland Lake Campground. Um, we had a looked like a big adult grizzly, probably a male that tipped over a dumpster at the campground. Um, they had five bear resistant containers there. Three of them were newer ones. And uh, those the bear did not get into. One of them was an old retrofit and the bear did get garbage out of that. I did set a trap right before Memorial Day weekend for three days and nothing showed up. And so we pulled the trap out before Memorial Day weekend. Uh, just because of the level of number of people that were there. And I worked with Mark Ruby to fill him in on what was going on with the Forest Service. And they were going to go out to get that those two old dumpsters switched out of there and get new ones into place there. So that was down at Holland Lake. Um, so Kim, Annis' uh, report that she sent to me, uh, she basically said that, I um, already mentioned that she caught that uh, three-year-old male that I had moved to the North Fork that ended up over in the Fortine area and that she uh, captured that bear and, and did kill it. And then um, just the same day that I caught the female on the 27th in Ferndale, she caught a two and a half year old male southeast of Eureka in the Rolling Hills subdivision that was killing some ducks. She put up a critter getter, a noisemaker, and that didn't deter the bear. And so she did set a trap, captured that bear and uh, no previous history and she was releasing that today on the west side of Lake Kukanusa. Um, she's also had a couple other very minor grizzly bear conflicts that they've resolved with electric fencing, uh, getting people to clean up, putting their bird feeders away. And um, she's also working on some permanent electric fencing for some small livestock in some of that area in the Eureka and Trigo areas. And I know she did go up the yak yesterday to talk to somebody about grizzly bear activity up there, I believe. So anyway, that was what she had provided me in terms of passing along you guys. Um, so like I said, it's been a busy, busy spring and I don't anticipate that it's gonna slow down much. We're getting calls uh, every day. So anybody have any questions? Okay, doesn't sound like any questions. Great, thanks a lot, Tim. Sure appreciate the update. You bet. I'm gonna to shift to region two um, uh, with Jamie Jonkel and, and after Jamie speaks, we'll um, give an opportunity for Rory Trimbo to check in as well. So Jamie. Yeah, can everyone hear me? Uh, yeah, I've got you just fine. Okay. Uh, so Jamie Jonkel, uh, based out of Missoula, region two. And um, our bear management team consists of uh, Eli Hampson, who uh, also helps out with black bear and lion stuff. Uh, then 
Eric Graham uh, is part of the team. He's with the Blackfoot Challenge. And then uh, I'd like to introduce Rory Trimbo, but he'll be uh, speaking with you later. Uh, Rory is uh, uh, just came on last fall and he's assisting us here in Region 2 and Region 3 as well. And then we have quite a few volunteers that uh, help us out <clears throat> down here in Region 2 as well. Uh, it's been a busy spring, uh, especially with the black bears. Uh, this whole month of May has just been continual uh, black bear calls, black bear conflicts. Uh, with grizzlies, um, you know, in March, we started getting our typical reporting uh, tracks here and there, uh, early April. Um, but by mid-April, we uh, started to see a lot of bears uh, congregating, you know, in the valley floors around uh, Sealy Lake, Obando, Helmville, and Lincoln. But most of the grizzly activity, you know, was in that Ovando and Helmville area. Um, we've been seeing this sort of congregation in the spring after the snows uh, kind of start leaving the valley floor in that home, uh, Ovando, Helmville area. Um, and I, I think part of the reason we're seeing this is just the fact that so many of our Blackfoot Valley grizzly bears have keyed into the agricultural crops up there. Um, you know, we've got corn starting to show up, got a lot of hay barley, awful lot of alfalfa, oats, heavy irrigation, and <laughs> sadly our, our uh, grizzly bear population is really figuring that out. Um, let's see, so it, it did start out uh, with uh, a, a, a conflict that involved uh, a grizzly bear uh, taking four calves over about a four or five day period. We work closely with Bart Smith Wildlife Services and uh, we did capture uh, an adult male. And uh, just due to the circumstances uh, and the fact that uh, multiple calves had, had been taken, uh, that bear was removed or destroyed. And that occurred on, on the 29th of April. Uh, we've also had two additional mortalities down here, both males. Uh, they were both shot. Uh, they're under investigation right now with the US Fish and Wildlife Service. So I can't really uh, discuss those at this point, uh, but I'm hoping to have some press releases out here in the near future. We've had a, a lot of phone calls, you know, just of folks reporting uh, grizzlies, hunters, uh, antler hunters seeing grizzlies, black bear hunters seeing grizzlies. Uh, a lot of, uh, sorry. Probably a bear call. <laughs> um, but we've really only had uh, six conflicts uh, thus far. And the one I've already discussed, that was the depredation involving uh, those four calves where we removed the bear. Besides that, uh, we've had five others. Um, so we had two additional depredations. Um, we had a single calf killed on the 7th of May, uh, 6th of May actually, and, and traps were set by wildlife services and we assisted them with the capture and then handling of two uh, male grizzlies. One was an older adult male and the other was a younger adult male that had been previously captured for research reasons. Um, there were multiple bears at site and uh, you know, the day that the uh, two were in the snare and the culvert trap, there was another free ranging bear and then other bears in the area as well. So it was decided to, uh, you know, because we couldn't figure out which bear had been the, in, the culprit with the depredation, uh, both of those bears were relocated to the north. Um, thanks to uh, Tim and Hillary for arranging that. Uh, one male went into the Whitefish Range and the other went into uh, Glacier National Park. 
then we did have another uh, depredation um, and it involved four to five calves, but uh, that, that's part of the investigation that I'm not allowed to talk about. Um, we've had three uh, kind of residential agricultural uh, conflicts. Um, so we had a bear uh, get into a, a open barn. Uh, we did not set traps, uh, but we did set up critter getters and, and cameras. Uh, bear came back a second time and then <coughs> did move on. Um, at another ranch headquarters in the Helmville area, um, you know, we have that carcass pickup program here on the south end until May 15th. And we try to get to those carcasses fairly quickly, but uh, we had a cow in a ranch compound that uh, did not get picked up as quickly as we had hoped. And as a result, we did have a grizzly get on that cow. And then uh, at the adjacent uh, place, uh, discovered crystal lick. And so we got that cow out of there right away and did put electric fence around the crystal lick buckets. Uh, but the bear kind of continued to hang around and, um, you know, because they were calving, um, we did set a trap and uh, had it out for about four or five days. But uh, the trap was actually, you know, luring in additional bears besides the bear that originally came in. So we did close that and we're kind of monitoring that situation. Um, and then we had uh, a bear uh, tear into a motorcycle, took the seat off, uh, pulled all the plastic off. I've had that happen several times in the past. Uh, so set up cameras, got critter getters set up. Um, hopefully that uh, has now been resolved, but we're, we're monitoring that situation as well. Um, let's see, just in terms of uh, prevention and education, you know, um, as soon as the COVID-19 uh, kicked into gear, we stopped doing a lot of our education and outreach. But prior to that, through, you know, February and March, we gave quite a few presentations to schools, especially down the bitter, but I guess that's sort of out of the ecosystem. Uh, but, uh, you know, around Missoula and in the Blackfoot. Um, we just wrapped up our carcass pickup program, the winter carcass pickup program that's sort of run by the Blackfoot Challenge. I didn't get a count yet, uh, but lots of carcasses uh, picked up and taken to our compost site. Um, let's see. Um, we are doing, we've already started two electric fencing projects uh, through the Blackfoot Challenge. Uh, there was a rebuild and extension on a ranching calving yard kind of uh, in between um, Helmville and Drummond. That uh, project has already been uh, wrapped up, brand new fence. And then our composting facilities with the uh, Montana Department of Transportation at Clearwater Junction, uh, that fence was uh, starting to age and starting to come apart at the corners. And we'd had some uh, bears get into it the last few years. So we are in the process of having that rebuilt as I speak. Well, let's see, uh, I continue to work really quite closely with Defenders of Wildlife, Aaron Edge and Russ Tilmo. We've got all sorts of, you know, preventative projects going on around the Region 2 area and uh, doing a lot of uh, uh, work with the elect through the electric fence incentive program. I've probably uh, I've seen about 10 different projects have been started this spring. And I'm also um, <clears throat> I've got the Wind River Bear Institute uh, volunteered up and they're assisting us as needed. Um, got all of our neighborhood networks kind of ongoing. And then uh, I was kind of excited, you know, on the very south end here. Um, I'll let Rory talk about this, but uh, we might have another composting facilities uh, in conjunction with uh, the state prison. But I'll let uh, Rory tell you about that, along with some of the other things he's been doing. But uh, that's pretty much all I have, unless uh, folks have questions.
All right, any quick questions for Jamie? And before we shift to Rory, feel free to jump in. All right, Rory. Hello again. Um, I'm sure a lot of you already know me or see me around, but uh, again, my name is Rory Trimbo. I'm the new Grizzly Bear management person um, based out of Deer Lodge, Anaconda area. Um, in this brand new position I just started in December. Um, this, this position was created to by FWP to uh, kind of be a proactive as bears start to move uh, into this connectivity zone here in between the NCDE and the GYE. Um, big part of this position is, is uh, supposed to be focused on you know education and outreach uh, as far as bear aware stuff, um, as well as responding to conflict issues. Uh, fortunately, kind of been off to a, a slow start in this new position, um, as you can expect due to the whole COVID shutdown. Um, so education and outreach part's been a little, little difficult. Um, before everything shut down though, uh, I was able to get out um, a little bit and meet with uh, you know, some of the local groups around here. Uh, I was invited to a Rotary Club meeting, uh, went to a couple rancher meetings, uh, stuff like that. Just try to get myself out in the community and, and let people know um, that uh, this, this position exists here now. Um, I was also able to do a lot of meetings with uh, some of the NGOs in this area uh, that have been doing a lot of bear work um, before I showed up. Um, so they've kind of created a good uh, uh, place for me to enter here. Um, so I was able to meet with some of them. Uh, getting familiar with some of the other agencies, the Forest Service, Wildlife Services around here. Um, as Jamie talked about, yeah, one of our big, biggest projects uh, that we kind of started working on back in January, February was the uh, new livestock compost site. Uh, unfortunately, there, there was one in Drummond, but um, fortunately they shut it down last year. Um, so we're trying to find a new, new place for that. Um, so we've been talking with the state prison in Deer Lodge, um, trying to work with them. Hopefully they can be a good partner for that because um, they already kind of have a, a working ranch there uh, as well as their own kind of compost pile. So hopefully we might be able to tie in with them. Um, it could be a good opportunity for them. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Again, that's kind of been slowed down too. Um, Hopefully we can meet with them and make some more plans here as things open up. Um, and then, yeah, so far it's been fairly quiet in my area, um, but Jamie's been really great about keeping me in the loop um, about things going on with, with those guys, with his, his crew, with Jamie, Eli, and Eric. Um, he's really been keeping me involved in, in some of those, those conflicts that are occurring up in the, in the Blackfoot area. So I've been involved quite a bit with that um getting out meeting people uh, being involved with that so um yeah and then for the future uh trying to do some uh work with some folks to try and maybe do some virtual stuff uh for the summer um if things remain closed down um so just trying to adapt and uh and do some some maybe virtual stuff for the summer so that's, I think, all I got for now. Great, thanks, Rory. So looking at the um, agenda, I think we'll shift to the Eastern side, Region 4. Um, I'm not, I don't think we've got Mike on, but I know that we've got Wesley. So Wesley, if you'll start and then maybe give us a heads up if you're gonna cover any other stuff for Mike or if I should switch to Gary Bertolotti for that, but um, we'll start with you. Hello, everyone, and good afternoon. Fortunately, it's been a bit slower of a spring here out on the prairie. We've only had four conflicts so far. Uh, one conflict was a calf attacked by a grizzly bear near Lake Francis. The calf survived. 
worked with Mike Hogan in that response and its protocol not to set traps when the calf is still alive. Uh, the other situation was on Muddy Creek where one calf was attacked and still alive and, and the other calf was killed. And so we did set a trap in that situation, but we weren't able to ca capture anything. That was with Kurt Medke of Wildlife Services. Uh, and the only other conflicts that we've had have been uh, bear bedding in a shelter belt southwest of Lake Francis and a bear on the outskirts of the town of Shelby. So with the slower conflicts, we've really been able to focus on proactive work, keeping people safe and keeping property safe. Of course, working with my technician, Sarah Zilke, who's been fantastic. Uh, so far this year, we've had 122 calls for information or service. 23 of those calls were actual bear sightings that we post on our Facebook page. We've proactively hazed 12 bears this year, and that includes the young. Uh, so we've been able to keep bears away from towns and people that way. We've initiated 29 call trees. We've had 64 in-person meetings so far. We've installed two bearware signs at important recreational sites around Valier. We've given away 13 bear sprays to producers already this year. We've done 26 proactive patrols where grizzly bears have been seen so we can go out and haze them before they cause problems or get close to people. Uh, we've deployed eight scare devices proactively where we think uh, bears might come in near homes because of grain spills. And so we've done that before the bears have come in to try to keep them away. Uh, we've had no captures yet this year and no mortalities. We have built three permanent electric fences already this year, one around a residential place for an elderly man on Lake Francis, uh, one around a chicken coop on the Teton River, and one uh, around a hog farm on the dry fork of the Marias River. Um, and we've installed two temporary electric fences around bone yards that couldn't be picked up. Our Kirkus collection effort has been full swing this year. Fortunately, we've had the same great driver back this year, which is the first year we've had a driver return. And we were able to do that by being flexible with his schedule. And so we've had probably the best Kirkus collection effort uh, that we've ever had in this area because of that. And that might be contributing to the reduction in conflicts. Um, let's see, I think that that is it. Any questions? Uh, just a quick one for me and others may have questions too, Wes, but the, um, just looking at the, those proactive scare devices, are those primarily sound? Sound and lights. Okay. Mm -hmm. Motion activated. And then um, I don't see, uh, didn't see Mike on and know that he's busy. Um, didn't know if, I know Gary Bertolotti alluded to some activity over um, in Mike's area. Don't know, Gary, if you just want to touch real briefly on what you had so far. Yeah, I have one question for Wesley. Hey, Wes, do you have a um, summary of our Marcus pickup this year? I, I know we had a little bit of slow start on that, but uh, wanted to get uh, folks in, in the loop on what we actually did on that. I'm sorry, I don't have those numbers right now. Okay. Appreciate it. Yeah, uh, Gary Bertolotti, uh, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, Great Falls Regional Supervisor um, on the east side of the NCDE. Um, Mike wasn't able to join us today because of uh, conflict uh, resulting from a black bear hunter and shooting of a uh, grizzly bear. Um, we've had two of those in the last week, both of them under investigation, so I can't really give any details on those. Um, uh, give you a real brief uh, summary of what Mike has been doing, and I'm sure I'm missing a lot of the stuff that he's done. Uh, there's been one capture um, of a male that was involved in a calf depredation, uh, working with wildlife services. I'm not sure exact location on that, but that bear was removed early um, from the population. We've had uh, two human bear conflict situations happening. First one up near Depuyer, um, individual uh, walked in on a, a sow with three cubs. 
um, was uh, mauled by the female, had a pistol and um, injured her severely. We went in a couple days, uh, next day removed her um, and then the cubs kind of disappeared. We finally found those. They ended up in uh, Montana wilds and we found a location to bring them to now. Um, the other one was on the Sun River about a week and a half ago um, where floaters were just getting ready to leave uh, for the final uh, day of their float. Uh, individual went into the bushes, uh, female came around the end of the bushes and um, uh, hit him. Uh, he was transported to the hospital. Uh, the bear, um, eventually we determined that the bear had a cub there, uh, probably a defensive um, incident and that bear and her cub left. Uh, we did not set traps on that one. Um, and so um, those two bears are still out there. Um, both individuals, uh, although injured, um, will fully recover on those. Um, and then he's had a couple other, well, um, uh, significant money calls on bear sightings and um, bears near uh, calving and cow operations. Um, and uh, basically those are the highlights. I'm sure there's a lot more Mike would have provided, but uh, that's what I have right now. Thanks. Any questions? I'll be glad to answer if I can. Great. I'll pause a second to see if there's any questions for Gary or Wesley. Great. Thanks a lot, Gary. Um, and thanks for pinch hitting there for Mike. I don't know that I could even begin to do that for Jamie's efforts. Um, let's switch. I don't believe we have anybody but from the Blackfeet, but I'll pause just to make sure we don't. And uh, we'll switch to uh, Stacy Corville. And I'm not looking at my list right now to see if you're still on, but I believe you are. Yeah, I'm here. Um, thankfully, it's been a, a slow year compared to what everybody else has done. Um, Carrie and I have put up a couple electric fences around chicken coops and handed out a couple a couple of critter getters, but but realistically, I mean, compared to last year, um, when I started trapping in February, um, it's been quiet on the CSKT. And maybe that's a, well, I don't know why. Um, I guess um, <clears throat> the other updates I would give is that um, people in carnivores, Bryce Andrews, um, is in the process of putting up a temporary, well, a permanent electric fence around a melon field between Ravalli and Dixon because the bears discovered um, Dixon melons last year. Well, probably before that, but. Um, and then um, the other effort we have going is similar to what the Blackfeet has been doing for years. Um, people that come into our office and buy recreation permits or hunting permits or fishing stamps, you know, um, for a $10 donation can get a can of bear spray from us. And that's in thanks to Defenders of Wildlife who funded that we're going to, we're going to contribute as well, but, um, I'm excited about that. And then the other thing we're doing is, um, developing some, um, permanent signs, bear education signs that we're going to put at some of the, um, scenic turnouts and rest areas. And they're going to be, um, probably something similar to what Wesley has put up and Jamie um, just, just trying to teach people that, you know, they're in bear country and to carry bear spray and be bear aware and 
Um, but yeah, thankfully, um, this spring for us has been kind of slow other than, you know, a couple chicken coops and um, just bears being in yards. And I guess that's it. Great, thanks for that uh, update, Stacy. Yep. Glad to hear that you're not inundated like some of the other specialists are, that's good news. Um, any questions for Stacy before we shift? Okay, um, John Waller. Good afternoon, everybody. It's been real quiet in Glacier too. We haven't had any visitor conflicts at all this spring. I think mostly because we haven't had any visitors. Uh, it's been very interesting spring. Nothing like I've ever seen before. Just very quiet. Uh, the bears seem to be out relatively early, but but yeah, there's not nothing for me to report. Simple enough. Thanks, John. So um, any other, I don't think I missed anybody, but I wanna to pause to make sure I didn't miss any specialists or folks who had um, anticipated giving an update there. And um, very much wanna thank the specialists for carving some time out to join us today. Um, as I said earlier, not our usual time to hear from the specialists. So we'll still look to have a report um, the end of the season from everybody. And it's a great chance I know for our public to see some, um, usually those, some of those reports just have some really great photos and some anecdotes and some of the solutions that have been put in place over the summer for fencing and the rest. And um, we always look forward to those reports in the fall, but um, thanks for your flexibility for joining us today. So I think I'll shift to um, the last main section of our agenda, which is just uh, roundtable updates and um, Again, there's uh, a lot of folks on this list, but not everybody has an update. So we'll just provide some time for folks to give any updates that they'd like to give as we move around the state among the agencies and tribes. And at the top of our list, I have uh, Hillary Cooley, and I'm not sure Hillary, if, um, if that means that uh, you are also Jody, but um, I'll let you take the lead. Thanks, Randy. Um, yeah, I just have uh, one main update. I know people might be interested in our progress on a status review. Um, we started a five-year review. We also call it a status review uh, several months ago. Every species that's on the uh, list of threatened and endangered species has to do a review every five years. So it's not specific to grizzly bears, although we are doing it for the listed entity for grizzly bears, the lower 48 states. So for that review right now, we are working on a biological report. And so we're compiling all biology data from every population in the lower 48 states. And we will use that to inform the status review. And that status review will recommend um, whether that listing listing up the lower 48 states as threatened should remain the same or if it should be uplisted or delisted. We can also make other recommendations at different reviews. Uh, the service has done that, whether maybe there's a DPS in there or something else. But at a minimum, we would recommend if that status is correct. If we do make a recommendation that something should change, we would go ahead with a proposed rule and a final rule. The status review is only a recommendation. And we have to take that next step to, to actually make something happen. And so we have committed to having that status review recommendation complete by March of next year. So March, 2021. And that was really it from my end, Randy. Great, hey, thanks, Hillary. And um, just pause a second to see if Jody had anything. Okay, thanks, Jody. Thanks for joining us today. So the, um, the next on the list is Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. And um, 
and I checked in with Ken uh, last week or earlier this week, and he didn't have any updates. Um, the only thing I had was more on the COVID related front for fish, wildlife and parks in general, and just that it's been um, odd like all the other agencies. And I really appreciated hearing from Jeff Mao. And so I thought I would take just a second to just describe a little what, um, how we manage things and right out of the gate for fish, wildlife and parks with the governor's orders um, and the stay home orders uh, parallel with that or with consistent with that was also the encouragement that folks get outside to recreate. And I know our federal partners each equally felt this. Um, so we were open for business at our fishing access sites and state parks. Um, and the biggest challenge, of course, was maintaining latrines and protective equipment for our staff to clean latrines and keep up on sites and saw record, um, certainly for the time of year, uh, record attendance at fishing access sites and state parks as rivers were being floated and, and spring fishing was really, really good in a lot of places, lots and lots of recreation outdoors. And then um, now our biggest challenge is figuring out how to open things back up. So um, had some hurdles to meet with campgrounds, opening those in, in a normal schedule and trying to keep those fairly online with what a normal spring opening looks like um, and meet the demands that are out there. And next layer for us will be those public facing portions of our business, which are lobbies and visitor centers um, and some of the fish hatcheries and places where the public like to come and get information and documents and buy licenses. And, and that's our a current working plan for us is to be uh, looking to um, here in the near future, probably sometime next week to try to open those public facing places. Um, still working on, on a very short timeline, trying to get some of that up and running with a lot of changes in how we do business and what the customer will see with us at the, at the lobbies with the, the shields and the guards like you see at the restaurants or not restaurants, but the uh, shopping malls and all the rest. So just wanted to point out that for us, it's been um, very business as usual on the outside. And now we're trying to figure out how to get the public facing places open. And I will pause just here to see if um, Gary Bertolotti or Jim had any other updates and just see if they had anything from their perspective that I missed. Thanks, Gary. No, I, I just add that uh, our bear team was working really strategically with the city of Whitefish, which has always mm -hmm. been a hot spot. And some really good things came out of working with them. Uh, Tim and Eric and Eric, frankly, we had a big crew that met with Whitefish and then COVID happened. <laughs> and now the city, the revenues changed. So, um, you know, it's more of a stay tuned, but I think we're working towards bear proofing. And on a personal note, my garbage can in Whitefish got hit by a bear. And luckily I sprung the 80 bucks and got the can at work, didn't get anything. So that's all I have. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, not much here, um, folks. Uh, just that, you know, we're continually working at this expansion of grizzly bears out onto the prairie onto private grounds and the egg and, and um, small communities associated with those uh, agricultural uh, areas and private lands um, will be a consistent um, effort for us to educate folks and um, keep bears in check as far as uh, out of conflict. But uh, it's a challenge and the expansion continues. Great, thanks, Gary. So sh shifting to um, USGS, and I know Claudia is not with us today, but Tabitha, I think you were stepping in today. Yeah, hi, um, good to see everybody. And yeah, I just wanted to update people on a couple of different projects that are uh, ongoing. Um, so I guess, first of all, um, we, uh, there was an interagency group of us working on, that has been working on US2 highway connectivity from a multi-species perspective. Um, and we just released the uh, second report related to that. And that second report uh, details a, a, a bunch of smaller pieces of information that we collected um, about where people have observed wildlife crossings, where they've observed roadkill, um, culvert information, and some other things. Um, and so that's, uh, I, I don't know if there's a place that we can post that, but it's basically, um, it's on the Park Services IRMA um, tool for one, for one thing, and I sent it to the members of this committee, um, but it should be publicly available. 
Um, that's the first project I wanted to update you on. Um, the second project is, uh, I've talked before about some of the Huckleberry work that we've been doing. Um, we have uh, basically completed the bulk of um, our intense productivity and phenology data collection. Um, right now, um, we are still planning to collect data um, in and around Glacier Park um, in collaboration with the Glacier National Park uh, Citizen Science Program. So if you are interested in once the park opens up um, or learning more about that, uh, you can email the Glacier National Park Citizen Science Program and you can just Google them and that will pop up. Um, but it's basically a, there's an, a, a survey one, two, three online app tool and you take a hike and stop and take observations of whether you see a huckleberry plant at that spot um, or uh, flowers and what, what kind of phenological stage it's in. And so we'll use that data for validation of the models that we're working on. Um, the third project I wanted to mention is um, one that's being led by uh, my collaborator, Andrea Morehouse up in Alberta. Um, and that's a, an evaluation of how um, grizzly bear rubbing um, is relates to the number of mates. And so is there more rubbing by um, grizzly bears that have uh, more detected mates and um, also more or fewer detected offspring. So that's kind of a rubbing, grizzly bear rubbing specific paper um, that's being, uh, she's been revising. Um, and so it's in the publication process. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to mention that um, with the uh, genetic data in the in and around Glacier National Park from 1998 to 2012, we've started to work up an analysis plan for um, assessing how changes in habitat, um, including uh, some of the fire, big fires that have been in the park over that time period, might influence uh, uh, grizzly bear density. So those are the um, four uh, projects that are related to grizzly bears that we've been working on. And with that, if there, if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to expand. Great, not seeing any questions. Um, thanks a ton, Tabitha, for joining us today. Yeah, thank you. And we heard from Jeff this morning, thankfully. And then as I look to the US Forest Service, I know we heard from Kurt. So. Um, and I, Carolyn Upton let me know that she wasn't going to be able to join us today, but uh, maybe we'll look to Bill to see if you had some updates, Bill. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Randy. And like you, uh, we do have our, uh, we have seen an increase in public use this spring um, outside what we normally see this time of year. Our campgrounds are open and uh, we too are working on getting our our, our offices uh, ready to accept visitors in a, in a far different setting than we've seen in the past. Um, but probably where I wanna focus my time is that we have released our final forest plan decision for objection. It went out for a 60 day objection period, May 21st. Um, and uh, this sets, you will set the management leadership direction for the forest, Helena Lewis and Clark Forest uh, much like the Flathead plan did for the next 15 to 30 years. Um, we are incorporating the forest plan amendment that was approved with uh, for multiple forests uh, through the Flathead plan uh, approval. So that is moving forward intact um, with that, our revised forest plan. Um, and, and the other thing I just want to mention is we're really uh, with this new forest plan, one of the biggest changes is managing by geographic area. In other words, we're instead of the old approach of managing by a multitude of management areas, we're looking at far more holistic management of uh, each of uh, the land masses that we manage across the Helena Lewis Clark by geographic areas. But um, again, that went out for a 60 day objection period beginning last Thursday after that objection period is closed. Um, We'll be responding to those objections, have an objection resolution meeting when we um, hopefully can resolve some of those objections. And then I look to be making a final decision early next year on that forest plan. Um, those are big updates. Thank you very much.
Thanks, Bill. Um, unless there's questions for Bill, uh, maybe uh, move to Brian. Uh, yeah, thanks, Randy. Um, what uh, I wanted to update is that uh, we are seeing quite a bit of, of the same activity that everybody else is as far as the numbers of bears that are going through the Tobacco Valley. But one, one difference we're having is uh, we're not getting the campground use that we typically would this time of year because the border is closed. We get a lot of Canadians, uh, Albertans in particular, that come down and use our campgrounds. Uh, uh, the difference is now we're also seeing a, a greater extent of our, our more local areas that are using dispersed sites. And that's a bit of a challenge because they don't have the opportunity to use uh, our food storage order and apply that as well as we'd like to have them in campgrounds. Um, we uh, uh, have some big news. That is, we're, we're looking at uh, starting Monday on our uh, West Kootenai Green Box site relocation project. That's going to replace two unsecured green box uh, garbage transfer sites and, and replace it with this one that'll be uh, state of the art with all kinds of electric fencing and, and uh, opportunities for us to keep all kinds of animals out of that site. That's been a long time coming. It's technically in the CYE, uh, but that is also uh, the connection area between the two ecosystems. And so real important for uh, both of those. That's uh, all I had to report, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Brian. It's good news on the transfer sites. Um, so, uh, Stacy, I'll look to you to see if you had any additional updates from CSKT. I didn't want to roll past you if you did. Not. No, no. Um, I think I'm good. Okay. Thanks, Stacy. And uh, let's go. I don't think Craig's on. Um, let's go to Livestock Loss Board with George Edwards. Hi, everybody. Um, Wildlife Services has told me they've been exceedingly busy this year and their investigations are up over past years. Um, kind of just follows what I've noticed in claims. But thought a point of curiosity for you guys might be um, 2019 numbers. We paid for 173 head of livestock in 2019, killed by grizzly bears, and only 79 by wolves. So grizzlies more than double our wolf numbers. Um, what I'd like to say is that we do have a grant cycle coming up. We have $80,000 right now that's wolf only, has to be used in calendar year 2020. And with any luck, we will have about $80,000 of money available for grants for our grizzly bear loss prevention projects. Um, our grant applications on our website, llb.mt.gov, and the deadline is June 30th. Our board will be meeting somewhere towards the end of July or the first part of August to award those grants. The state money, um, that we call our grizzly grant money is good for one year from when we issue it. So that can carry over into next year. I don't know if it's because of COVID, but the claims have not come in as quickly as they have in past years. However, um, in talking with John Stiber with Wildlife Services, it sounds like I have a lot of claims still to come in um, just from this spring. And that's really all I have. Great, thanks, George. Um, and I was momentarily distracted and just caught the very tail end of what you were saying around your 2020 grant award. Um, what's available there? Could you repeat those figures again? We have eighty thousand dollars. That's wolf only. It has. It's a fifty-fifty cost share. And we won't know exactly how much money we have that can go towards grizzly bear prevention projects until we close out the state budget year on June 30th. But um, just from looking at the figures I have right now, I'm guessing around $80,000. With the state money, it's a lot more flexible than the federal money in that it's good for one year from when we issue it. So um, you know, somebody that's looking at finishing out a project this year or wanting to 
start into one next year, the state money would be available. And again, the deadline is June 30th for those grant applications. Great, thanks, George. Um, pause here for a second to see if anybody else has questions for George Edwards. All right. Looks like I'm in luck. You're, you're, you're off the hook, George, thanks. So uh, let's go to Department of Transportation with Joe Wiegand. Yeah, I've got um, quite a few updates here. Um, I'll try to be fairly brief. Um, we've completed three years of uh, camera monitoring, uh, pre-construction and post-construction on that uh, project east of the Thompson River. And we haven't turned up any grizzly bears yet on that project, but uh, the new wildlife underpass has seen uh, substantial use. Um, a lot of whitetails were using it nearly immediately as, as soon as construction was done. We're seeing increased use by a bighorn sheep uh, and then a few mule deer, turkeys, and um, elk. I just uh, recently uh, captured some elk on camera using the structure and then uh, one mountain lion used it. Um, the grizzly bear uh, collision mitigation project uh, north and south of St. Ignatius. Uh, that's moving forward. We're getting a consultant on board to handle the, um, the landowner uh, right away negotiations um, so that we can get that done. That project will install a foot exclusion fence um, to connect the existing structures. There's eight structures um, north and south of St. Ignatius. Um, well, a couple of them south of St. Ignatius don't have any fence at all. So. That'll be good to encourage bears to start using those structures. We're not seeing nearly enough um, use of those structures. Uh, construction of that project is targeted for the spring of 2022. Um, a real uh, near future project is a short set, uh, section of um, Highway 93 north of Ronan is, is scheduled to be reconstructed. Um, and that one we've included wildlife exclusion fence also, and that will tie into uh, an existing underpass on that project. Um, the reconstruction project uh, also on US 93, um, north and south, south of Post Creek is still moving along. Uh, that one uh, has run into quite a few hurdles as far as uh, seismic and geotechnical uh, issues, as far as bridge construction. Uh, they've had several uh, artesian springs when they're doing their core drilling work. So there's a lot of concern about uh, what can be built at that site. Um, that's better than the existing uh, small bridge, but uh, you know, we're guaranteed to get a larger bridge on Post Creek. We just don't know what the size is going to be and how it will be supported. There's a lot of uh, seismic fears with that one um, as well as uh, any anything going into the ground, including the wildlife exclusion fence that will accompany that project. Uh, we're not exactly sure if the uh, if all the posts will stay in the ground. Um, let's see. Uh, we've got a feasibility study that's just wrapping up now for wildlife exclusion fence along I-90 between Drummond and Gold Creek. I think I've mentioned that one before. Um, as soon as that feasibility study is complete, we will be moving into uh, very rapid design and construction. We're hoping to get that fence up. Uh, it's nearly 10 miles of fence, but, um, and we're hoping to get it done by 2021, uh, the fall of 2021. So that, that project, project should move really fast in, in the near future to get done by that time. Um, a new development we just had in, in conjunction with that project is we have a culvert that was identified that's in need of repair. Um, it goes under both, both lanes, north, um, east and westbound of I-90. Uh, so it's a 216 foot long culvert. Um, it's fairly sizable. It's uh, over nine feet wide and over six feet high, but you know, being 216 feet long, it's a pretty long dark tunnel. But uh, Recognizing it uh, as an opportunity to provide wildlife passage um, and 
and really any reconstruction on I-90 uh, just doesn't occur anymore. You know, it's, it's very far and few between. And so this is a really good opportunity uh, to potentially get some um, uh, wildlife accommodation in place and, and improve habitat connectivity in that stretch. Um, but uh, MDT is reaching out to outside uh, uh, partners uh, to potentially secure funds um, above and beyond what MDT is going to be able to uh, um, uh, finance for, for that culvert installation. You know, right now we're moving forward with uh, a minimum structure design and trying to come up with estimates of what it would take just to replace the existing steel culvert with um, a similar size box culvert. And, and it's, it carries a pretty hefty price tag, but we also don't want to miss an opportunity uh, with that replacement. A um, few things going on on the east front. Um, the camera monitoring, um, well, I guess it's not the east front, uh, east of Lincoln on Highway 200. Uh, the camera monitoring on those new structures that were installed a few years ago is, uh, is still showing uh, use by single bears. Uh, Paul Sturm, my counterpart in the Great Falls District, is he's doing that monitoring and he said that uh, he has not captured images of any females with young using those uh, structures yet. And then he will be putting up uh, cameras and doing monitoring on the new structures that were built on Highway 89 uh, north of Kiowa. Uh, I think he's planning on getting that done this year. Um, so fairly big news and kind of hard to cover in a fairly short period of time is that, uh, you know, we're nearing uh, completion of wrapping up consultation ESA consultation with Fish and Wildlife Service for the US 93 North uh, corridor from Everett Ever to Polson. Um, with that biological opinion nearly complete, um, you know, it's, it's critical to get that opinion so that we can move forward with that uh, project I mentioned on Ronan uh, that falls under this, uh, this consultation. Um, but we've, uh, the, the service has been great. They've worked with uh, Department of Transportation uh, throughout development of the uh, biological opinion and, and CSKT. Um, all, all three uh, entities have been uh, talking throughout development and, and CSKT has been uh, critical in, in development of a lot of the recommendations uh, for that uh, opinion. And then also, I just wanted to mention uh, and say thanks to Cecily Costello because she turned out some uh, uh, phenomenal research and a very informative report uh, for the Fish and Wildlife Service to use there in their analysis for uh, um, bear mortality on the highway. And, and uh, so really appreciate how fast she was able to turn that out and, and the quality of the report that she produced. Um, and then I'll, I just mentioned that the results from that report really uh, emphasize uh, the importance of the role of, of highways and transportory transportation corridors uh, and the role uh, they play in, in grizzly bear conservation. And then it also really supports uh, MDT's continued efforts to uh, mitigate um, grizzly bear and vehicle collisions. So great, great effort by all on that one. And, and I look forward to seeing the final biological opinion. Um, let's see, I think that might, might be it. Yeah, that was a lot to run through. So I, I pre apologize if I covered anything too quickly, but I would encourage any questions. All right, any questions? So not seeing any, Joe, but I, just a really nice summary and just a lot of activity there. And what a great reminder to all of us of, um, I think it was three or four years ago, we talked about regularly um, needing to work with Department of Transportation and really making a commitment to having uh, you officially on the subcommittee and um, just a nice representation of the value of having you regularly, connect, regularly connected to the subcommittee and providing us updates and reports and getting these glimpses both on the, the uh, outcomes of a lot of your work as well as a glimpse to some products coming 
down the road that we need to be paying attention to. So thanks a lot for per continuing to participate and thanks for the update. All right, yeah, and thanks. You know, I, I wish, wish I could say that COVID-19 has slowed things down for us, but you'll be seeing those orange cones popping up like crazy soon. <laughs> Yeah, if anything, I, I was just reading the reports on both city and county also really taking advantage of it and getting a lot of work done while things were a little quieter on the streets, but they're not quiet on the streets anymore. So, all right, thanks, Joe. So uh, with that, I'm going to um, turn it to our public comment period. We're a little early. Um, and I think for this, uh, not seeing too many people, if anybody in the queue, um, Dylan, I might suggest we go slowly here as those who might be listening to us on YouTube um, see that we're shifting to that public comment period. Um, don't know that we need to take a break, but uh, turn it to you maybe to run through whoever we have and whoever you can see from your end and then we'll deal with that after we have some time and see if we wanna wait or do anything different there. Okay, thank you, Randy. Yeah, right now we have one person in the queue uh, with last three digits of their phone number. Uh, 995. So get ready, whoever that person is, I'll let you provide comment here soon, but I'll just give a reminder to anybody out there listening who'd like to participate in this meeting. Um, on our IGBC meeting page, there's a phone number to dial in on, uh, and that's 1-646-558-8656. And then the webinar ID and password is right there on the website. So go ahead and fill that out and it'll put you into this public comment um, queue or list and when you are ready to comment, uh, go ahead and hit star nine and that'll raise your hand in the queue so we know you're ready. Or if it's this few, we can just kind of go down the list. Um, and then please state your name and where you are from. And also please, um, if you could mute your computer as soon as you're queued up to talk, that way we don't get any echoing sound. So go ahead and for folks who want to provide comment on today's meeting or um, anything in general on are related to NCDE subcommittee, go ahead and give that number a call and we'll kind of hang out here for a little bit, but I will hand it over to the one individual that we have who called in. Um, so I'm gonna unmute you right now and uh, please state your name and where you're from and mute your computer. All right, are you there? Phone number ending in 995. Hey, Dylan, I think this is Greg Gustina from the Lolo. I'm just called in because I was using the phone line to, to get to the meeting. So oh, shoot. I don't have Sorry, anything Greg. to add. Well, here's a chance to add any okay. updates, I guess, if you'd like to. Sorry, I, I didn't know you were sitting there. I, I don't have any updates to add. I mean, it, we're following along pretty similar to what you heard for uh, the other forests in terms of crowds, you know, out camping and whatnot. Um, and I don't have anything else to add. But, but thanks for picking me up on that. All right, thank you, Greg. And that's Greg Gustina um, from National Forest Service. Um, I guess we'll just pause here to see if anybody else out there in the public wants to call in and provide input. So while we're doing that, I'll, I'm gonna start wrapping things up here just a little bit. Um, I want to do a, a round robin check with folks to see if there's any last minute things for the good of the order from anybody. And then I can give a little forecast of what we see coming at us for the fall maybe. Okay, not seeing any. So what I'd offer is just planning ahead a little, um, knowing uh, we have our normal fall meeting. Um, I gave myself a little bit of a reminder around September to start planning our normal fall NCDE meeting. Um, of course, we don't know what that's gonna look like for whether or not we're getting together. Um, we have a couple meetings scheduled at the IGBC this summer, um, kind of two in a row, one in June and one in July. And, um, but as the summer progresses and as we move in towards fall, I'll be prepared to start setting some things. Um, if it looks like we're able to meet in person, um, then I'll aim to coordinate that with the, the winter IGBC meeting um, like we've done in the past. And um, location is usually pretty helpful there. A lot, a lot yet to determine there, both in how we meet, where we meet and the rest, but just forecasting a little that I'll probably start really gathering that together in September. And then, um, and Dylan, looking to the attendees, do we have anybody else that have popped in there? We don't, no. Okay, well, I'm gonna, 
I'm going to uh, move us towards wrapping up then. And I want to say thanks to everybody, both for your, your willingness to join us on a Friday um, and also your flexibility to do this virtually. Um, after canceling this meeting, I was disappointed because I really do enjoy seeing all of you and getting together and catching up. Um, I'm disappointed that we don't have the ability for all the social bit because I know we get a lot of our work done both just in the halls as we bump into each other. Um, but I'm confident that we're connecting to each other in other ways but via email and other meetings um, to accomplish that stuff. Um, again, very thankful for your participation today and um, have a, a uh, really safe and fun summer and hopefully everybody's getting out and recreating. And I'll pause one last time to see if anything if anybody else has any uh, last minute thoughts they wanted to share and otherwise we'll close her down. All right, not seeing anything. Um, again, thanks everybody. And thanks Dylan for setting it up and all the technical work and the facilitation on your end. And um, thanks everybody and have a nice summer. <laughs>